OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. All right, you're very welcome along this Tuesday morning to another OTB AM. We're here with you until 9.30 and we're picking through the bones of what happened last night as Ireland drew one all, as Owen predicted in studio yesterday. Accurately predicted, Kenny. Is that right? Kenny, good morning to you. How are you? Yeah, morning, lads. Owen Sheehan, good morning to you. How are you? Very well. How are you keeping? You're a bit tired, are you? A bit tired, yeah. Apart from predicting, bloody fans. predicting the right <laughs> results time and time again. She's just tired yeah, of it. Yeah, tired of being tired of being right all the time. Who, every who day, day in, day out, week in, week out. Who'd have thunk it? One all. You didn't see this coming. <laughs> what's your take? What's your hot take, Kenny? Un, unfinished take at this stage. Seeped in. What immediate reaction? 24 yeah, hours on. Funny old reaction hours. after the game. I mean, they were celebrating. Obviously, they uh, they'd qualified. Obviously, our lads were disappointed, but only disappointed in terms of well. Lift a fight another day, that type of thing. I always felt the atmosphere was a bit funny leading up to the game. That kind of traditional last um, last game of the group, winner bust, winner takes all. This is it, you know. You know nowhere to go after this. Uh, no fallback scenario. It didn't really apply because you already knew, and actually for quite some time, that the likelihood would be we'd have a playoff play. So that was a strange feeling. I didn't really didn't I haven't really enjoyed that. In all honesty, that kind of a real kind of nervous tension that this is it, you know what I mean? There's, there's no way back after this. We've got to perform tonight, otherwise that's it, we're out. Well, I didn't, you didn't really didn't... sense that around the game. I know it was there for his automatic qualification if we'd won. Is that because there's a playoff, I think? Well, yeah, oh, absolutely, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So whereas I think the, that League of Nations, when it first started, that seems a long time ago, uh, <laughs> when we were having this League of, League of Nations discussion, but I think it's been very good in terms of the competitive nature. It, 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 the game's leading into this qualifying campaign, but I think where it's attracted a little bit has been in this respect in terms of well, everybody yeah, gets if we qualify, but yeah, if not, Georgia are in a playoff. Much, yeah, <laughs> like. and not knowing, not no, I mean, up until a couple of days ago, I was still asking, well, we're definitely, I mean, are we, we're definitely in a playoff. Well, wait, well, no, it's good, it's good. No one could be cast iron saying, yeah, and then in terms of who you're playing, home and away, all this kind of not confusion, but. Lack of certainty kind of created a little bit of, I don't know what it was around the game. It was a bit of an odd feeling, really, even after the game. I wasn't devastated, I've got to be honest with you, because I knew the likelihood is we still got a very good chance here to go on through. Well, two away games to go through. Yeah, but against who? It's not as if we're, we're, you know, we're heading to, to Germany or like one of the top European nations. It looks like it's going to be maybe Slovakia, Bosnia, the way people... Slovakia and the North, potentially. Slovakia in the north, is that what they're saying? That's, yeah. that's flipped now, that's flipped. Depends who you speak to. Yeah, no, so Slovakia, there's definitely people with flights booked to Bratislava already, right. put it that way. People are expecting Wales to beat Hungary tonight, which will kind of take them out of the picture in the playoffs. And I do think it is Bosnia. In the final. It, it brought it, it brought it in uh, Northern Ireland. Well, take that, in the other take semi. that. I saw the North playing in the other semi um, at one stage. So perhaps the people I've been speaking to have uh, fancied Bosnia <laughs> over Northern Ireland in that, in that semi-final. Uh, either way, it seems that uh, Slovakia is something that's going to be certainly on our radar. Get Wales out of the picture tonight, probably a good thing. I think after James McLean's goal, uh, those couple of years ago now at this point, I think they'll be looking for revenge against us and that'll be in Cardiff, obviously. And I, I just wouldn't fancy that. I think of all the possible uh, outcomes at this point, we probably want Wales to qualify automatically, don't we? Yeah, I'm not at that stage. You're looking at the potential. Oh, I hope we don't get them. Um, or really gone past that stage. Like you know what I mean. I really don't care actually, to be honest with you. Just into performance level, air performance levels, for me, are really going to dictate. I understand what you're saying about Wales, kind of the attack and threat which they uh, possess. Bale, obviously, Ramsey, obviously, uh, Harry Wilson. I'd throw into the equation there as well. He's having a great season down at Barnby, playing uh, really well. And some kind of talented footballers, but still not the team. They wouldn't frighten me. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd still back us. Yes, I think you're right. It would be a, probably our tough, one of our toughest opponents. But it's a playoff for a major championship final. Like we really shouldn't expect to be kind of, you know what I mean, tiptoeing our way in past the, the weaker nations. We're going to have to, we're going to have to beat a team of some of some quality. You would expect that to guarantee a qualification. It's interesting what you say uh, about the atmosphere last night. I certainly felt it in the build-up to it that there was kind of a sense that there was a safety net during the game. Obviously. There is the sort of growing of emotion, the fact that you can possibly win the game, which obviously gets the place booming, but also that kind of sense of the safety net as well. So, like, I, I don't know which way to look at that, like, to, to look at that uh, in a hugely positive way. We can see, actually, the fans, this is before the game, uh, out near Lansdowne Lane with uh, their flares. So, actually, it wasn't that subdued before the game. I actually completely missed this. This is the first time I've seen this. The atmosphere was good outside. I was, I was there some time before that. That looks as if close to uh, kickoff now. I was probably there maybe three quarters now before that. 
No, it was good energy outside, don't get me wrong. And even inside the stadium, national anthems, that initial couple of minutes from the game started, I felt, you could, you, yeah, you could feel it. It was good energy in the stadium all right. That dissipated a little bit, I've got to say, first half was very flat. The, uh, the game really lost its intensity of it, like, kind of very quickly, and that kind of leads in maybe to what Owen's saying about, obviously, them not having to uh, chase the win, maybe wanting to take a step back, take the pace out of the game. Maybe we weren't maybe as... We were maybe a little bit conservative in, in our approach in terms of maybe just taking a step off and maybe just assessing the situation, not overly committing ourselves, particularly in that first um, period of the game, the first half. So it was a very odd first half, I felt like, you know what I mean? Coming off a of half-time, it felt as long as the game hadn't started uh, after half-time. We certainly got that second half, a bit of intensity, a lot more energy, you know, making a few more tackles and... You know, getting ourselves higher up the uh, uh, the pitch, engaging them a little bit higher. You know, winning back a few turnovers, transitions were better, crowd were up. So I felt we were really in the game second half. Just just a shame, really. It took us that took us that long. I mean, I can understand it. A few of the lads were making the point in the commentary. Well, look, we didn't want to go after them and get picked off as we had done, kind of over there, you know, allowing them to kind of play through us. But I'm not sure. I'm not going to quite buy that one to be honest. Which as long as you go after the ball collectively as a unit. You know, the, you're, you're nice and compact and you move up the pitch together. doesn't mean you're not necessarily leaving yourself more exposed offensively if you go collectively higher up the pitch. Yeah. You're only leaving a bit of space in behind your defensive line, but as long as, as, long as there's good pressure on the ball, keeper's got a good start and position, you'd like to think that's not a huge threat potentially, the ball in behind either. Yeah. Particularly when you're playing against someone like Cornelius, who's a kind of lovely lasts. centre forward. But that's obviously getting a little bit bogged down, tactically like in the game, but... Uh, we're going to hear a bit from Mick McCarthy here if you want to stick your earphones in there, Kenny. Yeah. So um, here's a taste of Mick McCarthy's post-match comments. Uh, kind of makes disappointed that we're, we've lost that. Yeah, well, well, we've not qualified yet. But of course, if we're in the playoffs, we're not out of it either. Uh, but immensely proud of the players for the way they performed tonight. and uh, Even more so having gone 1-0 down, which was a poor goal to give away, I thought. Uh, I think Dockle says, you know, his, his, his man run on him, but uh, he's gone and got the equaliser, so I've got to forgive him slightly. I said I've, I was giving out to him about the goal and forgot to congratulate him about the goal he scored, so I'll go back in there and do that. Uh, so mixed, very disappointed, but very proud of the lads. I thought they were great. Do you now find a way to go and win a football match or to win two matches in the space of six days? That's the, the challenge. Yeah, well, I've got three months to prepare for that. Um, we'll see who we get. I'll, I'll plan for it when we get it, you know. Play the way we played. Play as well as that. Play as well as that against other teams. We can beat them. And I always said the game, if they, if they leave everything on the pitch, they give everything for me, the lads, I'll take that. And I've got to take the results, so I'm disappointed with that. But that is the only thing I'm disappointed with the whole evening. So that's the only thing that McCarthy's disappointed about is the result. Keep those in, Kenny, because Damien Delaney was on co-commentary for us and uh, he said that he wants Stephen Kenny to take over straight away in time for that playoff. Have a look. Just to be clear, because it's not an easy thing for you to say if you're saying it publicly, uh, Regime and Josh Cullen and all those players, but are you saying Stephen Kenny? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, 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 and it, 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 it's difficult. Because I, I don't think you feel good saying that. No, I don't, because I, I like Mick. I really do. I think he's a fantastic fella and all that. But look, we, we, we've tried this way and we've been trying it for a long time and, and yeah, we've had a little bit of success for it. But look, let's just start the process now and let's just, let's just go, man. He means let's just go and get Stephen Kenny in now for the playoff. So I didn't hear where uh, Dame is reasoning, to be honest. We just heard the tail end of it. Obviously, we played the, we played the full... Ball. There's five or six minutes of that. We'll play the full thing a little bit later on, but it's obviously not going to happen, is it? There's no way that they're going to replace Mick McCarthy now, three months out from a playoff. No, but I don't... I don't I, well, like I said, I don't think there's a strong argument for replacing Mick. If I was looking at that performance last night, uh, probably similar to maybe the end of maybe Martin's reign, you looked at the players, look kind of uh, disillusioned. We look a little bit ill-organised. Kind of lacking a little bit of spirit, kind of cohesion, to all of those things. That's when you sense that this whole thing is falling apart. The players have lost confidence in the in the manager in terms of what he's asking to do. All of those things, you know, bubble to the surface, and you think, well, it's over. You can almost see it. I mean, there was no hint of that for me in the in the uh, performance last night. I don't think it was the perfect performance. I'd probably disagree slightly <coughs> with Mick. I don't think from start to finish he looked that performance. I thought that's as good as we've got. 
as a team. Like I said, first half for me, I was probably a little bit disappointed. I've got to be honest with you. I thought, even in terms of how we wanted to play, again, I'm not sure if Damien's make the point about we can't keep playing this way, but <clears throat> me last night, I, I saw us try and play in a way which traditionally Orlis teams haven't played. I mean, I saw Dan Randolph get the ball on a number of occasions, goal kicks, centre halves, drop, full backs, and we looked to play uh, possession football like 25, 30 yards from, the, from our own goal, with Denmark putting a bit of a squeeze on us. And I was a little bit nervous watching it, to be honest with you. You know, we kept possession, give it away, didn't give it away too often, but invariably went back to Darren Randolph, he maybe uh, kicked the ball to the halfway line, but we were actually looking to play through the tours and play our way up the pitch. Now, that's not traditionally how Ireland teams have played. Not, certainly not over the last while, anyway. No, I'm, I'm not necessarily a big fan of it. I'm still not convinced we have the, the players to do. I didn't think we did it with any great effect, uh, in all honesty. And, and the couple of moments, first half, when we had a little bit of joy for me, when a couple of times the ball came into Glenn Whelan in midfield, and he had a quick look on his shoulder, and he went, woof, round the corner. He clipped a couple of balls into the chair. I'm not talking about aimless balls, just smashing the ball up the pitch. Where there I'm, was somebody running. Yeah, I'm talking about a little bit of eye contact. Dave McGold, not even eye contact sometimes, just his body language suggestion, lads. This is going first time around the corner. Yeah. Over the, over the left back, into that inside right channel. Dave McGoldrick, Je Jeff Hendrick, get on to that. And a couple of times he did that for us, had with a bit of joy. Centre half, headed the ball down once. Alan Brown picked up the second ball, which, it, which asked your midfielders to do. Anticipate the second ball getting knocked down, pieces, you know, the second balls. Yeah. He did that and almost got a shot on goal. Yeah. So OK, we'll, we'll come back to this a little bit later because there's plenty of detail to, to parse through. Right. Um, but I think you felt the performance was mixed. I think, that, I think a lot of people feel that the performance was mixed and we could do with them um, knowing exactly what our identity is. But we'll come back to this at 8 o'clock. We're going to hear from Gary Breen as well. That's what's coming up. Papers is next. We're going to do uh, Gary Breen and uh, Kenny staying with us, obviously, and we'll get uh, the lads' thoughts after 8 o'clock. We'd like your thoughts as well. You can just use the hashtag OTBAM or you can leave a comment on the uh, YouTube channel in particular. We'll monitor that all morning today and have uh, a chat with you about it. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash off the ball. If you want to watch us this morning, obviously the best place to listen to us is on the Go Loud app or offtheball.com. Uh, forward slash radio and um, yeah so after that sports news with Tom Malone at 8.45 more Ireland talk coming your way at 8.55 this morning and the Mayo Leaks latest there's been another twist in the saga we'll bring you that after 9 o'clock this morning you can tweet us using the hashtag OTBM time for the papers OTB AM so I'm going to start with the Daily Mail the front cover of the Daily Mail GAA stars US brawl shame so what is this about Two All-Ireland winning players have been sent home from a US trip after allegations that one of them filmed the other brawling with a fan <coughs> in the streets of New York. The brawler is a former member of an All-Ireland winning panel while he was recorded by an All-Ireland winner, it's claimed. So uh, there's footage doing the rounds on uh, WhatsApp at the moment, obviously. A team player is believed to have shared the video in a player's WhatsApp group, which was then shared on social media, an informed source so said. So I presume that uh, we're going to hear a good bit more about this because the footage is fairly stark. There's two lads brawling, there's skyscrapers in the background, there's um, the sound of uh, cops, and they are definitely uh, cops, it looks like it's in New York. And um, it finishes with uh, a very strong the right hook to the chin, which knocks somebody down. So, not good scenes, and you're gonna hear a bit more about that. Uh, back of the Daily Mail is down but not out, playoffs beckon for Ireland. So, it will be Bosnia versus Northern Ireland on one side of the draw, and on our side of the draw, it's either, it's gonna be part of that whole, Wales, Slovakia, if Hungary beat Wales, who knows what happens then? I'm not sure. Could be Bosnia, Wales or Slovakia oh, in semi-final at that point. To on that one. Uh, give me about two hours here to figure that one out, Kenny. Front page of the Irish Examiner sports section is drawing little comfort with a picture of Shane Duffy lying on the turf. Defined Ireland effort ends in more Dane pain. And that is pretty much the, uh, the tone from the Irish Examiner this morning. It's, uh, it, it is mixed, really. It, it, I, I think uh, at the start it is kind of agony that it will that they failed to kind of get that winner at the end. Um, but perhaps after the dust settles, the performance will either give people of a positive disposition a lot more hope, or people of a glass half empty disposition a reason to complain that perhaps why didn't we show this earlier in, in the group. So it's, it, there's a multitude of ways you can look at uh, what last night's performance means. The Racing Post are predicting that uh, Wales are going to finish the job tonight against Hungary. Fired up Dragon to finish job. That one kicks off at 7.45. And uh, Harry Winks is now odds on to make the England squad for the Euros. He's been cut from seven to four to four to six. Tab of the morning to you this morning. Possibly tab of the year. Some of the greatest Norse play of all time hey. in the back of the sun. Incredible. Better Back explain then. this to Kenny. He's, he's, not a, he's not on 
social media, so he's unfamiliar with why horseplay is suddenly. Did somebody not ring up the house? Uh, no, horseplay. Horseplay. I'm, I'm aware of that term, and obviously the. But it's in the news. It's in the news at the minute, Kenny. Oh, is it really? Yeah. All oh, right. Uh, th there is. Have you heard of the Koh Samui Cup? Koh Samui. Yeah, it's in Thailand. Yeah, oh, yeah. I know. I know the location, but not the competition. No. Well, so it, it's a new competition created uh, this week by some 19-year-olds uh, who were from Black Rock College, who were obviously on holidays. Were they Black Rock? They were. They're all yes. rock boys. Yes. And so, Happy lads, uh, I think I'm my no, way. This is going. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure when you, first time I heard. It, I wasn't sure where it was going, but it, it's relatively innocent. Uh, oh, good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you basically, it's a family show, Kenny. Relatively, the um, the the Coastal Movie Cup is basically the the four by one hundred medley in the Olympics, except you just got it down a pint. That once you get to the end of the hallowed pool in Coastal Movie, and uh, swim back as far as possible, and it, it it was by all accounts some of the greatest horseplay of all time. The voice message finishes with some of the greatest horseplay of all time, and this has gone viral because everybody's laughing at. Like, so it's basically the, a swimming competition on apparently they all a got bit tattoos of drink. as well. I thought you know I always preferred the more traditional. Used to hear the lads end the season uh, trips uh, back in the day. You head over to Cyprus or a club would pay for a, a week away for the for the players and the the games there used to involve the old. I know it's on the beach, obviously a few uh, drinks bottles or whatever. But it used to be the old put the thing in the sand and kind of. Run around put, us. Put your, yeah, put your head down on the stick around about 40 times and then sprint to the to the water so you could actually reach the, anybody could reach the water maybe at 50, 100 yards and of course you'd be deviating very, <laughs> nobody could manage a straight line run. Uh, obviously there's a scientific reason behind it, obviously spinning <laughs> so quickly like obviously Centrifugal force. Everybody. Yeah, yeah, just literally kind of run in a straight line. Wow. Yeah, that was reasonably comical, I must admit. This sounds a little bit more... So you're saying the cost of the movie... This a little bit straight lace. If you're talking about down on the point, jumping in the pool and... and no, 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 you jump in the pool first, so you, you kind of get your bearings. You do one length of the pool, Did down we? your point, get back, touch the... The pool, and then somebody else goes, and that's hardly like you know, yeah, Kenny, mad stuff, isn't Kenny, it? Allegedly, yeah. it was some of the greatest horseplay <laughs> of all time. We just weren't it there. Didn't involved off a top diving board, like diving off the top diving to begin with, or no, or, or, no. or literally drinking literally as you're swim. diving off the diving board. You literally have to down a point as you jump off the diving board before you hit the water. Yeah, that'd be well, don't knock yeah, that'd be funny, it. wouldn't it? Plastic cup, obviously, plastic cup. Oh, Kenny's really. right. Try harder, basically. That's what he's saying. Not the rugby lads will be expecting more than that. That sounds a bit weak to me. Right, OK. That's uh, that's big. So the... Today's takeaway, we'll do two hours in the football, but today's takeaway is going to be <laughs> Coast Movie Cup a bit weak. Are, are you suggesting that the people who have tattoos the, lad, the rugby lads can do better. The rugby lads can do better than that, far better than that. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but that is the headline of the back of the sun, some of the greatest Norse play of all time. Down but not out, then, is the sub-headline. Um, and kind of a fairly dejected-looking Matt Doherty on the ground after that one-all draw. Uh, so they go in the Telegraph. It is Jones' fear over Saracens' crisis. So Eddie Jones thinks that Saracens might try and pull a quick one in the Six Nations and not allow their players play for England, which, you know, would give England an excuse, would certainly be a very interesting uh, player power versus unions thing. This is obviously because Saracens got to look to 35 points and find lots of money because they're cheats. Um, and then this one, major telegraph investigation shows shocking lack of women in the boardroom. And uh, Southgate dreaming of Qatar, manager ready to lead nation into next World Cup. Gareth Southgate going nowhere. What did you think? We haven't had John since the Raheem Sterling. Did he handle that properly or not? I didn't know. I thought he got it wrong. Did you? Yeah, I thought he got it wrong, to be honest. I'm very surprised that he didn't deal with it <coughs> in-house. I think it would have been impossible maybe for him not to come out. But I think if it had come out or had it been suggested, there'd been some kind of altercation. I think he could have dealt with it very quickly. And by that time, the game probably would have been played. Sterling would have been involved in it. And everything would have moved on very quickly. I always felt it was the case of it was him and the association were desperate to put it out there. They've received a lot of po positive publicity over the past couple of months, particularly Selke in terms of how he's managed how he's managed uh, the group, this kind of leadership thing which he has in place. And, you know, he ha he's had a huge amount of um, uh, compliments. And, and understandably so, particularly on the, on the, from a footballing point of view, the team's gone well, he's introduced a lot of younger players and the team's getting better, it's growing, that's all good. But uh, it felt to me PR, he screamed of PR, we want, we want to put this out there, we want to be seen to be doing this is strong management, this is what strong management's all about in the modern game and I didn't buy it basically, I didn't buy it the fact when he came out and said all the players are behind me, absolutely no chance, there's no way every player in that squad was happy to see uh, Raheem Sterling stood, stood down 
and actually isolate from the group because that's what he did. And I'd have been a bit embarrassed if I was Sterling, almost borderline humiliated in terms of what happened. And I'm sure the people behind Sterling, sorry, I'm, I'm talking for fun here, the people behind Sterling were a bit absolutely fuming. So just to play devil's advocate for a second, right? Sterling had to have some form of punishment for attacking one of his teammates unprovoked? Uh, no. Not particularly. I, I, you say attack is obviously an altercation. He might have put his hands on Gomez, but... As so, long, the, the, as the, so the allegation is that he scraped his face with his jewellery when he was getting him in a headlock. That's was what that it? I thought yeah, you were going to go on. I no, thought you were going to go on. No, so... Uh, no, as long as the two players came together, as long as the players come together very quickly, there's acknowledgement, sorry, I, I lost my composure, I apologise for that. That's accepted. It's accepted amongst the players. For me, there's not, I, don't, I don't buy this. It's a bit like the Lampard thing which came out last week. Fines, big fines, this is it. Big discipli disciplinary. And this is the way we're going to... to show that he's, he's the big dog. But right. this is what I'm saying. For me, I was really disappointed in that. For me, that was big PR. I mean, you're trying to create a real kind of professional environment where players respect each other. Uh, that moved the whole thing forward. But at the same time, you're saying, but, but yeah, I respect you, I trust you. But at the same time, if you slightly step out of line through no fault of yours at times, maybe you're going to get hit with a massive fine anyway. I don't, and, and this smacked a little bit of that to me. So, OK, go and putting it out there in the public domain. So I, I didn't buy it. I think it was the wrong thing to do. And I think that's how it kind of panned out. You saw the amount of publicity around it. It kind of just went on and on. Even the gone missed a bit of Bill and stupid thing. But this is what happens. He, he, left, he left himself wide open. And I just felt nobody came out with a huge amount of credit. Gomez and those heads all over the place. Does he not have to protect Gomez a little bit? Like, so no, you don't. He's a professional. He's a, he's, a, he's a man. He's a professional. And like I said, and none of us were there, but I think we generally know what kind of uh, happened. We, we know Sterling uh, was the aggressor. But as long as it's going to very quickly, there's a bit of kind of contrition there. Of, sort of just Sorry, I'm still emotionally. And both the players themselves, as long as both the players themselves were happy with the outcome in terms of shake hands, let's move on. Generally speaking, that's what players are, are looking for. And I, I don't know how many... I didn't play in any kind of dressing room where there would have been uh, players demanding, going up to South, okay, banging the door, saying, you've got to take action against there. And that was outrageous, what I saw in there, him getting Gomez, like... Six for four, like a bit like a, like a cruiserweight boat. Outrageously got him in a headlock. We can't stand for this. You've got to go public on this, Gareth, and make an example of Raheem. Absolutely it was, it was no going to happen. So when he took him out of the game, it was going to, everybody was like, well, why is Raheem starting off playing? So that was where the decision to go public was made essentially on the back of the fact that they were dropping him for the game. Yeah, but that's, that's my point. So you're saying don't drop him for no, the game? No, don't drop him for the game. It's ridiculous. Like he's, made, he's made an error. He's he, he stepped out of line. Sit down, speak with him. Speak is he with not the... trying to bully somebody? Is that not, is that not, like, is that not ultimately, I am the superstar in this team and you did something against no, me which wasn't. I didn't for like? No, it wasn't. For me, it was a natural. It seemed to be just like, just lost the cool. Lost. Obviously, it was a bit of a... a bit of premeditation because it was a hangover from two days previously. No, I don't think so. Yeah, obviously, emotions were on a little bit high and obviously, there was something said potentially when he came into the room and he's reacted to her. But that's like just human emotion. It happens. As long as like immediately was kind of, there was, a, there was apologies made, sincerely made, and they were accepted, and people should be big enough to move on in a, in a kind of professional environment. That, that, that happens. You know, you can't, let it, you can't let it linger. And I don't think it needed this, it's okay to go down this particular road. Uh, I don't think the players were demanding it. I'm not buying into that uh, whatsoever. And, and I, I think rebounded on them. All right. Uh, here's the examiner, and it is drawing little comfort. Defiant Ireland effort ends in more Dane pain at Shane Duffy, lying prone on the ground in the aftermath of the game. Uh, is it hard to get back up after after this, where they feel like they played well, they feel like they should have won, they definitely could have won? No, no, I, I don't think so, because I think over the course of the group, to be honest with you, and even last night, I, I actually didn't feel as if we did enough to win that game last night, I've got to be honest. I think we deserved the draw, second half performance was better, the intensity levels were better, we, more like us, an Irish performance second half, and by that I don't mean crash, bang, wall, I've just smashed everything. I thought we got the ball into better areas down the side, which is always our strengths, get the ball into wide areas, got our full backs uh, involved a lot more, Andy Stevens and Matt Doherty in particular, for the last 25 minutes he was great almost controlled the game actually from that right back position showed real personality got on the ball and got us playing down that area of the pitch better crosses into the box but probably didn't create a huge amount of goal scoring opportunities you know create a lot of kind of havoc in around the Danish penalty box which is what we needed to do I'd love to see a bit more of that first half look I said I thought we were a little bit too uh, passive really can get any sustained pressure on their goal in that first half but second half was better I thought, we, I thought we played well, the energy was better, real momentum behind us and got real sustained pressure on the Denmark goal. So that was better, but it wasn't perfect. And I think over the course of the group, there hasn't been too many games at the end of it. I've come out after the game and thought, 
real opportunity slip there. You know, Denmark away, Switzerland home and away. I haven't come out and thought, oh, we're really hard done by there. Yeah. We should have absolutely wiped wiped the floor of them. So, so we, we uh, got we we returned the group. The group didn't lie. Yeah, no, 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 no real complaints. I don't think we can feel kind of hard done by in terms of the group as a whole, or uh, even off the back of the performance last night. It's interesting though when you think about it that, as Chair mentioned, everybody got a playoff except for Gibraltar. That, uh, like last night, I thought we see it here, best Irish performance in a long time. I think it was definitely the best performance in the group. And maybe you can commend the team for when it really matters putting in their best performance of the group. But I wonder, should there have been more scope for a little bit more ambition? And maybe some people would view that ambition as carelessness earlier in the group. I'm talking about going to Tbilisi, I'm talking about uh, other games in the group, perhaps one of, one of the games against Switzerland, even though they're a top class side that there was, this was always going to be the safety net. We've, we've arrived in the position even if Georgia finished above us. You know, it, it, like, I, I wonder, can, can we take away the positives from last night in isolation without thinking about what could have been at the same time? Yeah, I think, I think you're lucky. Dissect every uh, performance in terms of <coughs> how we could have improved, like collectively, I'm sure, make a look at the, the tactical setup of the team uh, over the past couple of uh, games. He's kind of... He's not chopped and changed, but the the Switzerland game away for me was interesting in terms of when he went from his natural kind of four three three four four two to that three five two. That was an indication for me that Mick was just searching for something a little that he wasn't maybe totally happy in terms of what he'd seen previously. The, the Georgia game it, it led into that, and I agree with Owen. That was an opportunity maybe Georgia away. Maybe it felt as if that was a game potentially. I'm not saying that of course the lads weren't weren't trying and, and weren't looking to go and win the game, but. Even last night, to be honest with you, and we played uh, Denmark. Was that six times he's played them? They have lost count the last uh, couple of years. But that's as bad as I've seen Denmark during yeah. the, those games. That's I've been true. really impressed with them in terms of how they've passed the ball, passed the ball uh, crisply. Combination plays been good, movements very good ahead of the ball. You know, we're kind of really switched on, very cohesive in terms of their passing, uh, their patterns all over the pitch. Last night, twenty minutes in that game, I was thinking they don't want it. Not that they don't. They looked. They look out. So they look really out of sorts. They really did. Ericsson was on the periphery of the game all night. Wide players couldn't get it in, into the game. Like happy just to take the easy pass, went moving the ball quickly. So again, he got that sense of last night. Wow, what a what a real. Didn't we did not knock him off the outer stride really uh, last night? They almost allowed us to, to play our way into the game, which eventually we did in that second half and carried a uh, threat for the last half an hour uh, uh, because of it. And almost could have gone on to win the game, but ultimately didn't. The uh, Irish Times this morning, their front cover is Ireland down but not out as fine display fails to earn a victory. And then they have um, interesting column from Ken this morning, uh, basically making the point here. Uh, Mick approached this team building project the old fashioned way by building from the back and hoping the rest of a team would take shape on that solid foundation. Ireland did finish with the best defensive record in the group. Switzerland and Denmark have been able to score goals against the other teams in the group because they have a plan for what happens when they get the ball. Ireland's plan is to get it to McGoldrick and hope he can lay something off. We are now exploring the outer limits of this approach. No, actually, I totally agree with it. I disagree with that. That's what I'm saying. I, I, if we did, for that first half last night, if Darren Ralden got the ball and we had a squeeze to the halfway line and Darren Ralden was shelling balls into the opposition half the pitch, we were fighting for uh, second balls and playing from there. I could say there's an argument in terms of, ah, oh, we're going back to caveman football. I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with it personally, but I could understand it. But you watched the game last night. How many times did Darren Randolph get the ball in his hands, you know, shell for everybody to get up to the halfway line and hit that big kind of 50 yard diag to Dave McGoldrick? I never saw it. I saw it two centre halves drop deep to receive the ball. Glenn Whelan comes short at the edge of the box, receiving, playing little balls uh, around the corner, trying to get a little combination. But last going. night was the first probably... night we've done that, right? The, no, 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 no. Across the group, we haven't been playing the ball through midfield. I think fields. we have done. I think we've been doing a bit of everything, to be honest with you. This is what I'm talking about. I mean, I'd be probably more of an advocate. Again, when I look at those uh, players last night, I'd be more of an advocate saying, well, hold on, lads let's just squeeze it let's go and play in the opposition ha half of the pitch let's bank ourselves on winning uh, more of those uh, second balls those percentage balls when they drop and when they do drop we're actually winning possession 10 yards inside the opposition half and let's go and play from there because the big problem I saw with us last night was actually getting from the edge of our box into the opposition uh, half of the pitch 
okay. uh, by by playing by playing the type of that type of combination football. That wasn't easy for us. So for me, th there's an argument for saying not all the time, but certainly mixing our game up. Go long. We've got lads who compete well high up the pitch. We've got lads who scrap uh, all the time for se second balls. Uh, we'll know that. We win our fair share, and we can go and play from there. And we can play the type of football. Oh, we want to see good football. Yeah, so do I. But I want to see it 35 yards from the opposition goal. I don't necessarily want to see it 10 yards outside our penalty box, unless we've got the ability to actually play through the press and get ourselves like a little overload as we travel up the pitch. So that's the kind of interesting uh, discussion for me. So, so that point that was made in the paper, I actually don't agree with it last night. For me, we almost went a little bit too far the opposite way in the first half. I think fundamentally the point is, though, irrespective of how we're trying to do it, we're a team that is designed not to lose games as opposed to win games. We're not trying to go out there and inflict our personality on matches at any stage over the course of this group. We were never the aggressor, even against Georgia in the game. Yeah, against but I don't Gibraltar. think that's a conscious decision though, Jerry. When you say we're set up to defend, if I'm setting an Ireland team up to defend and I'm playing kind of a, a, a three in midfield, okay, I don't so listen, I don't play Jeff Hendrick and Conor Hurahan. How are we set up to attack? Those three though? midfield players. They're not defensive midfield players. How are we set up to attack? What's our attacking philosophy? We, it's not so much for me. It's more so it patterns. How are you going to get the ball? If you win possession, you're a half the pitch. Have Have you got clear pictures in your head? How you How you're going to get from ten yards outside your penalty box to ten yards? That's the key for me. Because once we get into those areas, we showed second half, and particularly get the ball into wide areas, we carry a threat in terms of a bit of combination play, crosses into the box, people arriving into the box. You saw it last night. Balls getting hit out, picking up second ball again. Another cross. The, the goal was a great example of that. Matt Dockery putting a cross into the box. People throwing themselves in that they couldn't clear it. Ender Stevens picks up the second phase to the side, puts it back into the box. Mac Doherty's charging at the back post. Okay, Goal. We'll, so we'll come back to this because it, it, we'll come back to this. Gary Breen's going to join us. I want to play you this. So this is Damien Delaney's full post match thoughts. Here he is talking with Nathan. Some very interesting thoughts to share. Here he is explaining why, in detail, he wants Stephen Kennedy to take charge for the playoffs. Have a look. So we're not going to Euro 2020 yet, anyways. Yet another playoff for the Republic of Ireland. 1-1 against Denmark. Damien Delaney was alongside me on commentary. Did Ireland deserve any more than that? No, I think a draw was probably a fair result. We, do, we didn't do enough to win it. We, um, we didn't create enough chances. We didn't create enough sustained pressure on the, the Danes' goal. Considering they came for a draw, uh, I just felt that we could have done a little bit more to win the game. But it was just unfortunate. Uh, I know we rolled the dice in the playoffs. What could Mick McCarthy have done different to do what you would have wanted then, to go and put that more sustained pressure on Denmark? Yeah, I think at half-time it was probably um, I'd say obvious, but it was certain that they, the Danes weren't coming to, to, to win the game. They were happy with a draw. So maybe it could have been a touch more adventurous at half-time. But having said that, it's easy for me to say no in hindsight. Uh, Ireland were in ascendancy leading into half-time, and they were in the ascendancy after half-time. So you know, he probably was right just to leave it as it is. but. I don't know, just a, a bit more creativity on the pitch. We had a lot of legs, a lot of energy, a lot of hustle and bustle. Not enough creativity for me. The stats are pretty grim when you look at this group as a whole. Ireland's only victories, two against Gibraltar, one at home against Georgia. Didn't beat any of the team around us mm. yet again. Seven goals in our eight qualifiers. We all knew we were going to miss Robbie Keane. I didn't think anyone would thought it would be this bad. Yeah, I know, but I mean, when you have a player like Robbie Keane or, or even Kevin Doyle to an extent when he was, you know, kind of at his peak form, you know, he'd always get your goal out of nothing. Even Shane Long would do it as well at the moment. We don't seem to have any player that can get your goal out of nothing. You know, uh, Shane Long did it, Kevin Doyle, Robbie Keane. At the minute, Dave McGoldrick is a fantastic player, fantastic link-up player, everything about it, but he's not a goal scorer and he won't get your goals out of nothing. He'll, he'll, he'll give you 8, 9 out of 10 in his link-up play, in his all-round play, but he won't get your goals and unfortunately that's where we're lacking at the minute. What were the good parts out of tonight that Mick McCarthy can bring forward to March? What were the things he looked at and go, you know what, if we replicate that in a semi-final away from home, whether it's Wales, Slovakia, that he'll think we'll be all right. Uh, the same as what we've been getting. The same hustle and bustle. He'll choose energy and legs over creativity and, and possession-based football. He's just going to go that way in the playoffs as well and, and roll his dice because that's what he does. That's what he's good at. You I think, think that is rolling the dice? You don't think actually going out there? Because I think a lot of the fans will leave here tonight relatively satisfied that Ireland give it a good goal, put them under a bit of pressure. Yeah. You feel that actually playing like that is, is rolling the dice? Yeah, I do. I, I just think that we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not taking control of any situations. We're not, we're not trying to win games of football. We're hanging in there, we're hanging in there, hoping for a bit of luck, hoping for a mistake, hoping for something to happen. 
Uh, and then when Denmark go and get the goal they get, then all of a sudden now we come out, Denmark drop off, sticks in Duffy up front, and we're into the land of hit and hope again. And unfortunately, there's no control in, in what we're doing there. Uh, and we're reacting to what happens throughout the game. And I'd love to see us go there, which we won't, but I'm just saying I'd love to see us go there and, and maybe try and take control of the game a little bit better. Stephen Kenny is going to take over after the Euro 2020 campaign, be it after the finals next summer, hopefully, or after Ireland exit at the playoff stage. You were interesting during commentary. Just to be clear, because it's not an easy thing for you to say if you're saying it publicly, uh, Regime and Josh Cullen and all those players, but are you saying Stephen Kenny? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, 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 and it, it, it's difficult. I, I don't think you feel good saying that. No, I don't, because I, I like Mick. I really do. I think he's a fantastic fella and all that. But look, we, we, we've tried this way and we've been trying it for a long time and, and yeah, we've had a little bit of success for it. But look, let's just start the process now and let's just, let's just go, man. Yeah, I mean, that's because, I, you know, when I watched that game, I was a little bit upset when I said that because I thought to myself, how much more are we going to keep looking at this? How much longer is this going to actually take? And I just think now it's time to draw a line under this, under this style. You know, we're going there and we might, we might win a game. Could we win two games playing like that away from home? We might, but I, I, I don't think so, and it's not certainly not going to be in our control. So I just think, why not draw a line under it now and, and, and take a step in the right direction? Set the road now and let's just go. Uh, and blood young players. I really like to look at Josh Cullen the other night, Troy Parrott, Jack Byrne, all these guys need to come in. And whether Mick's the man to do that or not, or whether Stephen Kenny comes in, I don't know. But it just, it just pains me to say that we're going to go to Slovakia or Wales and just, you know, do the same again. You mentioned Dave McGoldrick's performance there, and he played tonight like he plays for Sheffield United. The difference is that when he's with Sheffield United, they're obviously a very well-drilled team, and yeah. when he holds the ball up, everybody around him knows what to do. They get involved. That didn't happen, particularly in the first half with Brown, Hendrick and McLean. Was that individual performances there or was that just the system? I just think that, uh, you know, Jeff Hendrick's not a player on top of his game at the moment. Uh, he's seriously lacking in confidence uh, and he just seems to be a player that when the ball comes to him, he's a little bit nervous. Uh, I think uh, uh, we're a little bit better when Alan Brown was moved in centrally. I like him, he's got good energy, good legs and he's technically a good player as well. Um, Jeff Hendrick still gets picked for every single game and he's been in and out of the Burnley team. It seems as though he found a little bit of form with Burnley. We thought at the start of this campaign when he scored the goal against Gibraltar, maybe that would be the kickstart to get things back up towards Euro 2016 level. It hasn't happened. Should Mick McCarthy just take him out of the fire for a little while? Oh, I think so. He needs a little breather because, I mean, he obviously is under an enormous amount of pressure playing for Ireland. He feels it. He looked like it tonight. He looked like a player that was under pressure. Um, so maybe pulling him out, and if you want to play Alan Brown in that position, because he's almost a carbon copy, but Alan Brown is full of confidence at the minute with Preston being top of the championship, so I probably would put Alan Brown in there. Uh, Glenn Whelan would probably play, and Conor Horan does OK, but again, you're probably looking for, could you stick in a, a Josh Cullen there? You know, he's playing uh, regularly for uh, Charlton, so there are the changes that I'm saying. Let's just start the, the process now. I do worry for you because you've been a player for the last 10 years, We've been sitting through this for the last 10 years. It's going to be a long decade ahead for you. No, it won't. I think that, uh, you know, once this playoffs is, is out the way, whether we, you know, I uh, hope we qualify, genuinely do, because it would be great for the country and it would be great for everyone. We could all actually row in behind the team. But I just think that, you know, uh, once Stephen Kenny comes in, uh, we can start the path to, to moving forward again, because at the minute it just feels like we're standing still a little bit. All right. Great stuff, Damien. Thanks. Yeah, very strong stuff um, from Damien Delaney calling for a regime change at the moment. Kenny, you've got your arms folded. You don't agree? Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't agree with that at all. Probably giving me reasons uh, already. It's going to happen, but it's going to happen It's going to happen next uh, July. That's, that's agreed, and I think that's the right time for that transition to take place. I, I, I don't see the kind of despair. Obviously, I had a look at the game last night, I analysed what was good, what was bad, as you do every, every game. But again, I got no sense of that performance last night. We need to change here. You know what I mean? We've, we're going nowhere here. We're going round and circles. So not, not from the players, but um, Damien's point about we're looking for a break, we're hanging on here, we're hoping to get something. I feel that. I think a lot of Ireland feels, fans feel that. No, I don't, no, I don't, no, I don't agree with that so either. What's our plan to win the game? How are we trying to win the yeah, game? But, but, but Damon talks about there, we need to get more creative. Um, talking about, like, we know Robbie. Robbie Keane was not a central midfield player. Robbie Keane didn't get on the ball in central midfield and dictate the game for us. Robbie Keane was, was a goal scorer. We got the ball to Robbie Keane around the penalty bars, he scored goals. It, it was as simple as that. When you talk about creativity in the team, you, you, I, I guess you're talking about a little bit. Uh, 
um, lower down the pitch in central areas. But I even argue that I don't necessarily, your creativity has to come from a central midfield area. Yeah, it helps in that area of the pitch. You've got somebody who can get on the ball, control the tempo, good range of passing, etc. Can play in tight areas. That's the absolutely ultimate. Look, we haven't got that type of player. But you know what? To be successful to qualify for ma major terms and be competitive, we don't necessarily need that type of player. When I, when I look at their performance last night in terms of creativity, I look to our fullbacks. I think we have a real creative element in our team okay, well, in, so let, in wider areas of the pitch. Let's talk about the fullbacks, right? So let's talk about that because we had this experiment for about half an hour with the three centre backs when we, we have in our team two fullbacks who are used to playing wing back and we didn't put them in that position. When we went to three at the back, we picked the wrong team and Mick threw out the experiment after 40 minutes because it wasn't working. He tried it once. Instead of sticking with it and saying, I'm going to give this 90 minutes and give the two lads who I know are really good, vibrant attacking fullbacks, the opportunity to play in their best position. It was almost like he was half committed to it. He was trying to be a little bit pregnant. Yeah, but you, you still do that. In the modern game now, even in an orthodox back four, you can still get your fullbacks high and wide. Just be, just be, you don't have to play a back three to get your, your fullbacks in the modern game to high and advanced But positions. my point is, even when he was trying to do something right, he picked the wrong team. It's, just, it's, like, it's like Mick McCarthy's thinking. His, what team are you talking about, minutes. by the way? What team are you talking about? You're talking about the team in Switzerland. We went to a back three, three, yeah. five, two. Yeah. Who were the fullbacks? Yeah, James McLean and Seamus Coleman. Yeah. Why not pick the two lads who are actually playing in that role week yeah, in, week out? But then again, I like the idea of Andy Stevens when you're going to go to back three. I like the idea of two fullbacks playing at those two wide positions because they're, because they're more than covered then stepping forward into midfield positions. So I like the idea backs. Being centre backs, yeah, when you got that back three, you want to encourage those two wide defenders to be able to step in and go and be productive in the opposition half the pitch. When you got two full backs like a Ender Stevens, maybe even you could argue like a, a Seamus Coleman or and, and over on the right side, you're more likely to do it. They get those players travelling in. I take your point if you're picking. But uh, sure, we've got John Egan, so he could definitely do one of them, right? And he's playing really well there for Sheffield United at the minute, so he knows exactly yeah. what that role is. So, but, but like, I don't necessarily. I don't, I don't want to get into an argument. We have suddenly now we have to play three five two. We've got and, and the Stevens and Matt Doherty are playing in in a wing back position for because this way we have to play at internet. We can still utilise those strengths. We saw it last night. We saw them get in the second half. We saw them raiding forward time and time again from an orthodox full back position and still being uh, productive. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a three five two system to get the best out of those full. It's the last 15 minutes of the qualifying campaign, the entire qualifying campaign, we're finally seeing our fullbacks being given the licence or the opportunity no, I don't, to do well, that. Yeah, you can tell me, Jerry, Mick McCarthy and his coaching staff are sitting in the, in the dressing before every game, saying to our fullbacks, be very careful now stepping out over the I halfway know, line. I I'd say doing. the opposite. They're I don't know what being they're encouraged. doing, Ender Stevens came out and said that they didn't practice. They haven't got enough ball. But Ender Stevens came out after the Switzerland game and said they didn't practice three at the back of training that week. And then there was some suggestion that they didn't practice it because they were scared that they were going to be spied on. They didn't practice the three it's of the a back quick training. turnover. You're three, you're three days in between. You're three days in between. You don't in, do in, one in the session? game in Georgia. Yeah, once, but that's a different argument that you're ma making. Now, your argument making, in terms of maybe the organisational point of view, which, which, is, which I think is, has actually been quite good. Well, I think so, that's been the one obvious difference with Mick and, and the coaching staff coming obvious. in. No, but if your initial point you were making, you've, you've moved the goalpost now, the initial point you were making about we've got to play 3 5 2 because we've got two full backs who operate in wing back positions and we're very successful. Now, for me, there's a stronger argument for, for those players playing in a, in a 4 3 3 system because in a 4 3 3 system, when you play with natural uh, uh, wingers, when those full backs match, Doherty and Ender Stevens get the ball immediately they got somebody to link up to immediately head 10-15 yards ahead they can play the ball into they can play little one-twos they can get on the overlap on the lap whatever they want to do there's better chances to get good combinations as a fullback when you've got a winger in front of you when you play as a wing back you don't have those natural options okay so that, 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 that's a, so that, that's that's a tactical that, debate fair yeah. enough we can have that but sorry, my, my, my point really isn't about moving the goalposts it's about suggesting that we're not making consistent decisions based on what we're trying to achieve because I'm not quite sure that Mick knows what he's trying to achieve with his team I, and it goes back to the, the original point it goes back to the point Damien Delaney's making how are we trying to win games what, what is it that we're doing that the Ireland team that Mick McCarthy's teams are yeah. doing to try and win games and it seems from the outside that it's hang on defend well Nick something from a set piece. No, it's not. It's not. It's not going to hang on. The, I don't think the the game plan is before the game. Right, we're going to drop deep onto the edge of our penalty box. We're going to sit. We're going to wait and wait for that one sloppy pass, and then we're going to try and count uh, counter attack and hit teams uh, on the break. We, we like we don't want possession of the football. We're going to allow the opposition teams to play. I think there'll be there'll be times during the game when that will be the case. You'll drop into a reasonable defensive shape. We probably saw it in the first half. Probably a little bit too much last night. Dropping off, filling those little pockets in behind where Denmark have hurt us previously. Maybe 
making sure they couldn't thread those little passes into Ericsson, those little pockets, wingers coming on the inside. And we were reasonably successful at that. But for me, it meant we were a little bit too passive out of possession and really couldn't wrestle any control away. So it's not a case we don't want to play. It's not an easy thing to do to get on the ball, keep it and kind of dominate possession. I don't think we have to be a possession-based uh, uh, team for me. I'm, I'm not looking to control 55, 60% possession of the football. All I, want to, all I want is to have enough possession of the football, football in the right areas of the pitch where we can utilise the best strengths we have, have available to us. And if you look at our, if you think about best moments in this qualifying campaign, Jer, think back to our goals. Our goals last night, two consecutive crosses into the box. I'm thinking about a, McGoldrick's goal against uh, Switzerland. James McLean, cross into the box, even deflected, but didn't matter. Arrived into a dangerous area. Goals from general play invariably, from an Ireland perspective, arrive because of a little bit of creativity, a little bit of quality in wide areas of the pitch, good quality delivery into the box. These are our strengths. This is what we're good at. Even the, are we doing enough of that, though? Do we look no, like a team who are trying to do that as a, as a matter of course? So yeah, so this is my point. We've got to do more of that. If we can do more of that, get, get more possession in those areas. That it, but this is why I'm talking about, well, for me, in terms of being maybe at times a little bit more aggressive, getting a little bit higher up the pitch, engaging people a little bit higher to get those situations, those little transitions, turnovers, and get more possession. OK, I can the, buy that. I think we do carry a threat. But, but I, I can buy that, but I don't see us doing that. I see us... Like, I see it sometimes taking the ball off the goalkeeper and sometimes giving the ball to the goalkeeper to kick long. I, I right. can't see so that. So that's a fair... So that's, what I'm, so that's what I'm talking about. So what are we? So, so, so this is what I'm saying. This is, this is me looking at the game last night thinking we're playing out from the back, keeping possession, kind of passing our way up the pitch predominantly. That's all well and good. That's fantastic. Very easy on the But can we do it? Can we actually do I, it? I think we might again? be able to do it, right? I don't know because we, we haven't had enough period of time of people trying it. We're not... Like, we, we picked a central midfielder on the right side of midfield last night who, you know, had a difficult job because that's not his, his normal role. Um, maybe if we wanted to do that, you've got to put Jack Byrne on the team. And even when there's five minutes left to go, you're thinking, now's the time for somebody who's going to come on and do that. And there was no yeah, sign I think so. of him. No, I no, no, no. I would have been, yeah, I would, I would have no problem whatsoever last night, Jack Byrne coming on, playing in that kind of number, uh, no, number 10 role, like your suggestion just off. And I think, I, I think you're right, Jack stands alone a little bit in terms of the qualities he has in that position and being able to play on the kind of half turn you know, little congested areas with his head up, that little killer pass. I think he has a bit of that. And, and Jack's uh, opportunities may arri uh, arrive going, going forward. But I don't think that's the answer in, in isolation. I do, where I do agree with you is in terms of the point that you're making. In terms of the qualities which uh, we have, for me, I think it's pretty obvious in terms of where their strengths lie. When we get good possession in wide areas of the pitch, in advanced areas, that's where we carry our real threat. Good quality delivery into the box. We didn't have that all the time last night. I actually don't think our delivery was crosses. perfect, but we got into some very good positions. And when we do get it spot on, and uh, I'm going to earmark Leo Connor a couple of nights previously against New Zealand, receiving the ball 30 yards from goal in a wide area, not a huge amount of options. Tell you what, I'm just going to put good quality delivery into the box. What happens? Goal. Because we have people who, are, who will throw themselves in there. They're brave. A little bit of good quality the movement. The Danes did it, and their guts where their goal came from. It was just, it was just a cross into the box. That yeah, and a very good, very good cross, don't get me wrong. But it's still a big part, a part of the people forget. It's still a part of the, the, the modern game. And it's very difficult to defend against. Fair when enough. it's done well... Very difficult to defend against. And I think that at least there's, a, there's an overarching philosophy behind that, which I, I doesn't feel like there is with the team at the minute. Just to go back to Matt Doherty, right? The first game in Gibraltar when the weather's bad, the weather is so bad that like the, the, you can see the planes in the background kind of almost blow up. Well, we touched the planes. It, 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 wasn't a, it wasn't a great occasion to play football, right? But we pick Matt Doherty on the right side of midfield and we give him a half and we say, no, that's never happening again. And he, he's essentially a sub for the rest of the competition who only gets to play last night because the captain is suspended. Like, surely there's some way of doing this and finding a room for him in the team and for Seamus Coleman. Well, give it to me then. Is that easy? How do you get well, Seamus Coleman and Matt Doherty in the team? Well, your, your team would treat the back. You. Your team would treat the back. Your team would treat the back. As if this is a simple solution to stand us in the face. Well, well, give it to me. Pick him as a wing back. Who? Maybe Seamus Coleman doesn't play. Pick him ahead of Coleman. Well, you say, you've just said how do you get them both in the team, but now you're saying you're advocating dropping Seamus. That's fair enough. But you've got to say that. That's not an argument for getting both of them in the team. OK, but your, your team were three at the back, had Coleman on the right side right. of the three. And it had, I presume it had Matt Doherty at right so, there, so that's an argument for me. So that's a, that's so a reason. So there's an opportunity, but we, we threw argument. that out straight away. We threw Matt Doherty out as a, like, even pick, pick Doherty on the right side of midfield and see how it goes again. Give him more than one game. No, I think it was the right thing. For me, it wasn't the answer. Even before the game is Gibraltar, I was advocating actually Matt plays a left back 
against Gibraltar. I thought it was the type of game, although it was a competitive game, we could have actually had a look at him there because I was very keen to get him involved because of the qualities uh, which he has. But I have to say, since Enders come into the team, he's been absolutely brilliant. Can't take any of the team at the moment. Not even productively going forward. His defensive side of the game has been absolutely outstanding as well. So I give credit to Mick for that, actually putting end and he's done fantastically well. So now you're right, now the conundrum is, and it's going to be a conundrum for Mick going forward to March in terms of who actually plays now. Seamus isn't in the Everton team at the moment. He's not getting a, a first team football. Matt continues to play and keep his form off the back of what we saw the tail end of the game last night. But Mick's potentially going to have a big decision to make. But again, how, it is an interesting question going forward. I mean, obviously Seamus hasn't got another five, ten years at, at, at this level. I think that's a that's a fair thing to say. And I think Matt Dockley looks as if he's the he's the heir to, uh, to that position. Although I would say Lee, Lee Connor, Leo Connor played really well there last night. But you're right. To get them both players in, in, into the team, you could be looking at a back three, Seamus playing right with three. Whether Seamus now actually has the legs, the mobility, the athleticism, maybe to play that role, I think that's maybe an argument in itself yeah. as well. I think there was a case for an argument maybe a couple of years before, maybe not so, uh, so much now. But I think it's going to be a big decision for Mick in isolation in terms of Matt or Seamus Coleman in their orthodox right-back position for the playoff game next March. OK, we've got uh, Gary Breen with us. 21 minutes past eight this morning here on OTBAM. Gary, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you doing? Very well, yeah, I'm good, thanks. You guys? Yeah, good. So um, this conversation is off the back of um, Damien Delaney's post-match uh, piece with Nathan last night where he was saying that he thinks that ultimately we should move on from Mick at this point to give Stephen Kenny the opportunity to take over now in advance of the playoffs because we've reached a situation with Ireland where it looks like we're hanging on and trying to win games as opposed to actually going out there and and dominating, or not dominating, but at least having a philosophy that is designed to try and win matches as opposed to just hang on and not lose. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but that's the general. Yeah, I think you are a bit there because I don't think Mick McCarthy ever sets the team out just to hang on as such. But in terms of, I, I know got to know Damien well over the last three or four months, but that's a nonsense. That's a nonsense thing to say that suddenly just gives Stephen Kennedy the job for the playoffs. I think Mick McCarthy um, has done a good job. I think a lot of people think there hasn't been an upturn since Martin O'Neill um, went. I think there's been a massive upturn in organisation more than anything. Again, I'd argue that we have a level of players that we um, have probably had better in the past. I, I think everyone would admit that. But I think Mick's got them organised. I think it's a camaraderie, it's a togetherness, and they're playing. And I was, I enjoyed that game last night in terms of certainly the beginning of the game, centre half split in, expansive, playing through the thirds, a lot of rotation in midfield. McGoldrick dropping deep, runners in behind. I was looking at that and thinking, do you know what? A lot of work's been done on a training ground and that's something you could not have said about the previous manager. OK, so, uh, Kenny, feel free to come in at any point because Kenny was like... I've been talking too much. <laughs> Kenny I, wasn't that keen Gary. on how we played in the first half. I'd actually dis obviously agree uh, wholeheartedly what uh, Gary said originally. I wouldn't agree on totally in terms of um, how successful we were playing that type of passing football out from the back. I was a little bit nervous uh, watching us play those little combinations. Gary's talking, uh, the uh, centre-half splitting, uh, Glenn uh, coming deep, trying to get involved, playing little balls around the corner. I was never, never convinced we are going to bre break that Danish press. And I wasn't like, totally committed. It was kind of a half-hearted one for Denmark, but I was a little bit nervous. And more often than not, Brainy, we ended up going back to Darren Randolph at the, at the end of six, seven consecutive passes and it was kind of a scoop clearance for him and he was barely reaching the halfway line and then it was a fight ball, big open spaces, people picking up the second ball from there. I never saw us make four, five, six passes, play through the press and end up with a little overload driving at the Denmark uh, penalty box. So that's the argument for me, the kind of risk and reward playing this way. I said it to Jared, the best moments for me first half, when Glenn wheeled the ball right to Glenn Whelan's feet for ten, five yards inside his own half, and he just flipped it around the corner twice in behind the Danish left back. We compete with the next ball. Alan Brown picked up a second ball, flashed the shot wide, and we actually got a little bit of a foothold of the ball in the opposition last tour of the pitch. I'm not saying we have to play that way all of the time, but it's something which I think first half we actually leaned away from. So I, I'd probably disagree with you ever so slightly in terms of that kind of uh, possession base. Let's play out, keep the ball, and work our way slowly up the pitch. I was a little bit nervous. I, I didn't think we were very convincing, and, and maybe we, we hadn't got the players in key areas of the pitch to, ex to actually play that type of football you were talking about. I like I like the fact that, say for example, in contrast to Georgia, where Harrahan and Jeff Hendricks were trying to get in those advanced areas and playing a little bit more direct, and the game just passed them by. 
I think last night we saw quite often Glenn Whelan, even Harrahan, dropping into full-back positions and giving an easy pass in to John Egan. And if then mid, the midfield of Denmark went to press and then John Egan's more than capable of to break line. So I like that type of idea that they'd worked on that, tried to suck the Danes in a little bit. Yeah, listen, in terms of executing it, we probably don't have the players who are going to do it consistently well. But I still was impressed by the fact that they were trying to do that. But that's the point. I think that's the interesting point that you make in terms of, again, I agree with you in terms of this has been uh, worked on, on on the training pitch and making the coaching staff have to be applauded for that. But you've made a point there yourself. We're looking to play a certain way. But have we actually the players who can execute those type of passes, particularly when the pressure comes on and those key areas of the pitch? You've probably alluded to, to it there yourself. Do we not have the players? Like, do we really? Are, are we not in danger here of accepting Trapattoni telling us we don't have the players and Martin O'Neill telling us we don't have the players? And... Never, I've never said that. I've always felt that these players are, are, are more than capable of what um, Martin O'Neill kept saying and saying, we ain't got Robbie Keane, kept banging that drum, we haven't got this, we ain't got that. Listen, we don't need telling. We know this is not our strongest ever group as such, but they are capable of more. Mick has got more out of that group than the previous manager did. So I, I think that constantly comparing ourselves with what Martin O'Neill did, obviously he got to the Euros and reached the last 16 of the Euros, uh, is, is a false, it's like, that wasn't acceptable. So if you're slightly better than that, that's not acceptable either. Like, I'm going to repeat this point once because we talked about it already. I don't want to get too much into it. But when we, we did go three at the back against um, the Swiss that time. We didn't practice that in training. And we got that from the players in the aftermath of the game. So they asked the question in the mix zone and uh, the left back said, oh yeah, no, sorry, we, we, we actually hadn't gone, we hadn't done that in training that week. Kenny's making the point that there was a three-day turnaround. But whether or not there's a three-day turnaround, you at least do one training session, surely. So the notion that we're working on everything in the training ground, I'm not sure that the evidence is there for that, Gary. Well, in terms of when they went to that three at the back in that game, yeah. I think that was to that was to maybe take away a little bit of pressure that had been building that they were struggling just to get us back in the in the game. And I think at times in that game, Mick McCarthy was good at his in-game management just to get us to half-time regroup again. Now, whether or not that that is something they worked on and, and said like with like 10, 15 minutes before half-time we're going to do this, I, I couldn't tell you. You would have to ask the players that. The players but. said that they hadn't worked on it. That was the thing. That was, and that was where everybody's like, "Hang on a second, what is the difference here between what we're seeing at the moment and what was there do you, do you under O'Neill and under Trapattoni?" Do you generally think there hasn't been an upturn from Martin O'Neill? Because I've I've heard you over the couple of weeks going into this game, and you, you you've got a bit of a really negative tone around Mick as such. And I know you're probably wanting this Stephen Kennedy, Stephen Kennedy to come in and, and take over. I don't know. Do you do you generally be, believe we haven't improved? Well. What is our philosophy to try and win games? That's my, that, my question keeps coming back to this. We've scored seven goals over the course of the campaign where we've played Gibraltar twice and we've had Georgia in the, in the group. Georgia scored seven goals in this group, which is to suggest that we're now at their level as an attacking force. I don't see any particular style of play where the managers come in and say, this is how we're going to win games, this is how we're going to score goals. I, I do feel like we've improved defensively. I think that we're also picking players uh, in the midfield who are trying to pass the ball around and that's definitely an improvement. So from from the end of the O'Neill era, it's definitely an improvement. I do feel like if we're constantly just using the O'Neill era as the, the bellwether and the measuring stick, then that's wrong. We should actually be trying to aspire to something slightly better than that. I, I feel like... I, I think, oh yeah, listen, I, I think Mick will be aspiring to something better than that. Having played with him, how expansive we were under his team. I know we had better players as such when he was initially in charge. But I, I just don't. I, I, in terms of him taking over from Martin, I knew that that squad was on its knees. It, it generally was. The connection between the, the players and the supporters was at his lowest ebb. So I, I listen. You have your opinion. That's fine. But I, I do believe there has been an, an upturn. Listen, I'm not delusional, or naive, or or just thinking wishful thinking. I don't think it's been brilliant because there've been times in terms of that Georgia game, that Swiss game, where we we've been woeful. Our ball retention is not good enough. But no one can tell me there hasn't been an upturn from Martin O'Neill. But Irrespective of whether or not there's been an upturn since Martin O'Neill, that's like it's this weird kind of false duality where that's yeah, not I, the I only take your point about in. yeah, like, I take your point. What about are we the trying to do? Yeah, what are I we trying we... to do to score goals and to win the game? Yeah. I, I don't see enough evidence. So let's get away from this like what's our fly? Let's start to talk, talk, talk about philosophy. I don't even know what it means. Well, how are we trying to win a game? Yeah. So what we got to do? We got to find a way of playing where we create more chances for me, more chances during the course of ninety minutes. And what 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 we're doing that we're not leaving ourselves open at the other end of the pitch. Football can be simple enough in terms of being defensively solid for the majority of the game, but also carrying an, an attacking threat. 
And for me, I'd like to say, I think we can create more opportunities. Because like I said, the times during this group where we, and we haven't, it's been a struggle for us during this group to get that kind of sustained pressure in the last third of the pitch in terms of creating chances which invariably lead to goals. If you look at the uh, ch goal shots on target during the course of the group, it has been great. We've had moments during games, the last 10 minutes over in uh, Denmark, the last 10, 15 minutes against Switzerland, again, kind of chasing the game, etc., etc. But we've got to find a way of playing or find some patterns of play or commit to something where we actually can guarantee during any game five, ten chances, ten, fifteen crosses. For me, it's all about crosses and um, penetration in the last third of the pitch. For me, that invariably comes from wide areas of the pitch. So we've got to find a way to get from, like I said, the edge of our box to the edge of the opposition box as often as possible in, and get the ball into those wide areas. How are we, how we going to do that? And you, you call it philosophy, you call it philosophy, whatever you want. Just find a way, f find a pragmatic way of getting the ball into the last third of the pitch, for me, as quickly as possible. Because if you're playing all your football in the last third of the pitch, it's an obvious thing to say, as opposed to, uh, to 30 yards from your, your own goal. It means if there is a sloppy pass, if there, if there is a miscalculation in, in, in terms of delivery, wherever it is, you've got time to rectify the situation. You've got time to recover, get back into a good defensive shape. Play all your football in the opposition half of the pitch for a load of different reasons. Get, literally, get as far away from your goal as you can. It does, I mean, it's, pre it's, pre it's pretty simple, I know. But plan, how are you going to do that? Yeah. Are you going to do that by playing, by playing out from the back uh, through the thorns? Are you confident enough in your place to be able to do that, to get enough possession, higher up the pitch? Or do you need to take a slightly more direct uh, um, approach and direct approach to me doesn't necessarily mean shelling it from the goalkeeper all the time it can be a case of th throwing the ball out to a fullback squeezing to the halfway line a fullback dropping out receiving the ball 10 yards inside his own half and look at the play from there and maybe a ding the ball into a centre forward's chest if one of your wingers comes short and drags in the opposite fullback it might be a little clip ball into the inside the right channel saying to your centre forward uh, Dave McGoldrick off you go run the channel there make that ball stick we'll go up and join it so whatever the answer is we've got to find a way get more possession build more uh, uh, sustained pressure on the opposition goal because once we do that we really carry a big threat when we can get good ball good possession and good delivery in those wide areas and high up the pitch are you, are you not, is that not exactly what are you, have you not just arrived at the same conclusion there that you're saying that we have to find those solutions and you're saying I haven't seen those solutions I haven't seen like you're, you're just kind of getting bogged down perhaps in, in the yeah, well, that's what, that, that, well that's what that's, I think I've said already to Jerry yeah, that's where I agree with him ever so forget about philosophy just how are we going to get the ball from our half yeah. into the opposition half. It's just a word. Don't worry about build, it. Yeah, yeah, and build and build attacks, and you've got to build yeah. pressure on the opposition goal. And we don't build enough sustained pressure on the opposition goal. And it's a shame because when we do, we carry a threat, and we have the players to carry. I just a threat. Mean, does Gary agree with that? You, like the, the the idea that there is no. Can we use the word philosophy? Yeah, no, let's no, no, the, no, no. Use a different let's, word. Let's, let's use the word uh, plan. Plan. Template. Like, is there a template? Template. Do, do, do you agree with? So, so uh, I, I think I think Kenny and Jer half agree with the, the, that. Perhaps there is no template, or at least we need to find a better template. Yeah, that's what that's what Kenny is saying of getting into those positions of creating opportunities. Do you do you go along with that point? Yeah, listen, in terms, I mean, it's a pretty generic thing to say. We want to get our team in the final third and put crosses in the box. Which team in the world doesn't want to do that? Do you know what I mean? But the problem I have in that is that if you're where it will probably fall down is if you're getting those balls in a wide position to James McLean or asking him to step inside and, and, and make an option so that his fullback can play balls and can he play on a half turn, then James does great for us crashing around, but he, he don't look after the ball particularly well enough in terms of getting the ball into him. If you're saying, that's our great hope, getting it to James and open he creates across, then I think a lot no, of work not, has to be it's, done. It's not now. about James in isolation, Brie. We've got two of the best for me in terms of fullbacks. We saw it again last night. We had it, we've had it with Chambers for years. Now, potentially, we might have it with Matt, Matt uh, Docker. We saw a glimpse of it with Leo Connor did tonight, and certainly with Ender Stevens. In terms of the quality of their delivery uh, in the last tour of the pitch, Matt even more so in terms of his combination play coming on the inside yeah. and playing little cover ball, balls. So, I'm not, this isn't about like a James McLean getting James McLean on the ball. This is actually about getting our fullbacks on the ball, if anything else, uh, high up the pitch and getting those little combinations wherever those players are, in wide areas, and not overcomplicating it. Whenever we get half a yard, good quality delivery into the box. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and getting you, players... you know from me, in terms of the way he's set up there, he's, he's going to want those fullbacks to get in advanced areas. The very fact that they did last night shows that. It's just whether or not you've got good enough players in central midfield to look after the ball to enable them to get up there. Because 
if you think about Sheffield United and the Stevens, they look after the ball well enough. He can get in advanced areas. And if you think about Wolves as well, in terms of Matinho Neves in midfield, they look after the ball field far better than us. So it's difficult. You want to get them, those guys in high advanced areas. But if it breaks down in terms of our ball retention, which has probably been our weakest aspect, not just under Mick, but for a, a, a considerable time. But at the same time, don't, <laughs> Joe, you're about to jump in. Don't be telling me Stephen Kenny's going to make our centre midfielders be able to play on the well, half turn. Maybe, maybe he doesn't pick... James McLean, and maybe he doesn't pick Jeff Hendrick when they're not looking after the ball, and maybe he only picks players who can look after the ball. So, I, look, I, you said earlier on you'd been watching and that I'd been negative over the last while. That I, I want the team to have an ambition, and it, it doesn't look like we're. If there is an ambition, it's not being communicated properly, it's not being carried out, it's not being executed. So, And when Mick does his press conferences, he never says, this is what I'm trying to get the team to do. I would like the team, whatever, that, whatever his plan is, it's not explained to the public in a way that we're all like, okay, no, I know exactly what we're trying to do and we can pinpoint where it's breaking down and what, what's responsible for it breaking down and then we can all have an informed opinion. That's the issue here, I think, that he's never tried to bring us all along and say, okay, well, the, the Irish football public needs some kind of vague understanding of, of what we're trying to achieve. Here's what we're going to do. These are the players who are tasked with doing it and if it breaks down, well, we've given the players all the support we possibly can. That's what we want as football fans and as football supporters. Yeah, listen, I'm a fan, but I, everything you said there, I don't think that Mick McCarthy's not doing that. I, I don't know if you, what do you want someone in, as a PR dream just saying um, about philosophy and expansive, we're going to do this and the DNA of this and that. What are we trying to achieve? Gareth Southgate, basically. No, not, <laughs> no, yeah. well, not, not Gareth Southgate. I'm asking for somebody. No, I take it, but I think you can see you know a bit I mean? of that. But yeah, I think you can see a little bit. You're saying about Mick needs to verbalise that. But I think, say, last night, I think you could actually see that on the pitch. Uh, Gary alluded to it there in terms of, clearly, Mick, uh, there was conversation, there was work on the training pitch in terms of, right, lads, Darren Ramble gets the ball in his hands, this is what we're looking to do. Shane, John Egan, these are the positions I want. Glenn, I want you dropping in there. Can you entice one of their centre midfielders in? Open a bit of space in behind. If you do get the ball, can you play it uh, around the corner? Jeff, can you, can you find a little pocket? Full backs, high, keep it nice and high and wide. So I think you, you can you could see a little bit. So you're talking what's his philosophy? If you could actually see it last night. For me, what's it's how ambition? effective it's how effective we can be playing that type of football. I take your point. Throw Josh Cullen and Jack Bourne in there. Are we a little bit more capable of playing that type of football? Yes. Possibly so. Yeah. Maybe we might have a look at that. Maybe it might be under Stephen Kenny going forward. But at the moment, with the players a mix committed to playing in those areas of the pitch, for me again, uh, I'd like to see us actually. It's not it criticizes those players. At times, bypass those players. Those players in midfield that people are saying can they really play under pressure Glenn can he really play in tight areas don't ask them to play the ball over his head into the front players let him go and join from there facing the opposition goal and let's look to play and engage the opposition a little bit higher up the pitch some people might say that's a little bit crude but for me that, that, that can be reasonably effective and I think that's a style of play or a partner play or whatever you want to call it a template which actually we, we've been reasonably successful at over the, over the years Gary, last word on you to this. My issue is that we don't know exactly what the ambition of the team is and what they're trying to achieve, because it's a little I bit know what the, I know. I <laughs> don't say we. I know what they're trying to achieve. You. What, what, what are they trying we, to achieve? You, you just said we don't know. I know. Yeah, well, I, I so don't. Say, so I Kenny don't Kenny didn't know earlier. He was like, we were trying well, to we'll be a little bit... say you and Kenny then. Don't say we. Now don't drag me okay. into all the audience. Oh, don't drag, okay, okay. drag me into you, it either. I know exactly. I what can tell you. I can see what... Us. We've just told you, I'll tell you what the ambition is, taking up a, a squad that's on its knees, trying to give some confidence back and playing. Listen, it hasn't been as smooth throughout it, but I could see exactly what they were trying to do last night. And I think I would be going into the playoffs now with confidence. I think they'll work on it more so. And if you talk about ambition, I'll tell you what McCarthy's ambition is, to get Ireland to the Euros. That's his ambition. On a game-to-game -game basis, how is he trying to play football? To win. What do you mean, how is he trying to play? How is he He's trying to make sure... How is he trying, is he, is he trying to win scoring seven games and eight goals? Again in a it doesn't, it's, not, it's not exactly winning football. We scored seven goals. We had Gibraltar twice. We scored seven goals no, in eight games. I know all that. I know all that. But look how many goals we... Listen, this is not a, a team that's full of goals as such. So he's, he's making do with what he's got and he's trying to make him competitive. But you're talking about ambition. What You've asked me. Okay. What's his ambition? His how ambition is, he... is to get Ireland to the Euros. All right. And on a game-to-game -game basis, how are we scoring goals? Well, at the moment, a lot of them's been headers, isn't it? Crosses into the box. <laughs> Kenny's saying about that. What do you? you I, I think you've got this dreamy notion that as soon as Stephen Kenny comes in, we're going to be expansive, playing through the thirds, peppering the goal. Listen, I hope it's true, but he doesn't have a CV up to this stage that warrants 
suddenly thinking that that's going to happen with this group of players. Well, I look, his, his under-21 team have played football, Dundalk played football, everywhere he's gone, the teams have tried to play football, and so if it, you, did, uh, it has we're been talking successful. About what they've done, yeah, yeah, you're talking about, have you seen Mick McCarthy's teams play football? Have you? Are you just going on what you've seen there? Did you, do you remember his team going to Holland and playing football, going to Portugal and playing football? Yeah, Roy Keane I remember his team at Wolves. Oh, OK, so just Roy, was it? No, he had, well, I mean, Roy Keane was one just of the best Just Roy, passers. yeah? One Just of the, Roy. So, but, one of the best uh, passers well, in world lucky, football was in this team game, at that stage. Absolutely. He's a world-class centre midfielder. I know that about him. Yeah, but that he's helps. encouraging us as a group. Of course it helps. If we had Roy now, I'm sure we'd be passing more. Look, Mick and Sund then we might be showing more ambition. Mick Sunderland team got relegated <laughs> from, <laughs> the, <laughs> philosophy from the Premier yeah, League. Yeah, Mick Sunderland team got relegated. I know that. I with know, a record low points them. total. I know. I was in the team. You don't have to tell me. I was there. <laughs> What was your ambition? What were you trying to do? Uh, don't have your play, but we did. I tell you what our ambition was. We had three million pounds to spend. when We got promoted, and when we when we were in um, after playing Chelsea, losing two one, he said that to Jose Mourinho. He cracked up laughing. He said you got no chance, and we didn't. Fair enough. Well, I, I hope that Ireland have some chance. You think we're going to qualify at this stage? Two away games, probably more than likely Slovakia and potentially Northern Ireland or Bosnia in the in the final after that. Yeah, listen, I, I, I'm. I will, I'll be positive about it. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I would like to see who we're playing exactly, what their form is, who is available for us as such, and, and we'll, we'll take it there from there. But it's a, it's a couple of months now to regroup, to work on things, I'm sure, in terms of how we can beat those teams. But um, I, I thought that was um, a good effort last night. All right, Gary, we'll leave it there. Good stuff. Thanks very much. Hopefully Thanks, we'll, Joe. Good luck. Hopefully we'll have um, Connolly in the team by the March time, March rolls around, maybe some goals. The goal would be nice. I, I know it's not part of um, the conversation you're having there, which was very, very entertaining as a, a bystander, by the way. Um, the, the, whole, the whole idea that Mick McCarthy was appointed on a temporary basis just kind of looks more and more ridiculous. If we actually do have these, uh, the temporary part being ridiculous, that if we have actual calls from people like Damien Delaney now for Stephen Kenny to come right in, and we had the safety net there all along. Why would he not no, do no. your experimental thing during the nation? I'll tell you why Mick this, was brought in. I'll tell you, we forget. I'll tell you why we Mick were always going to get a playoff. Okay, so I'll tell you why Mick. I'll tell you why Mick was brought in in, in terms because it, you sensed as if it was a real low ebb amongst the squad. You felt as if something was broken within the squad. Again, I'll be totally critical of Martin. Uh, Jerry's reference, they brought us to a major finals and needs to be applauded for that, and, 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 and absolutely uh, rightly so. But at the end of, the, uh, of his time there, it was broken. You could sense there was a kind of distance yeah. between the manager. The so I had to end. So the question was, quick turn and very quickly, who can we bring in, who can bring the players uh, uh, on side and turn things around very quickly, just pull that dressing room together. And for that reason, for me, Mick was doing I'm not saying Stephen Kenny couldn't do that, but for Mick, for me, was an obvious candidate to do that in a short period of time. I actually think it's been, it's been a very good decision in terms of how they've set it out, in terms of allowing Stephen Kenny to cut his teeth at international level with the under-21s. Vastly experienced manager. I'm a huge fan of Stephen. Great experience in, in European football uh, with Dundalk. Let's not forget that. But actually, it hasn't tasted into national football and even the bit of experience he's getting with the 21s from me just in terms of preparation time with the players etc and the valuable time he's spending with those younger players those young up and coming developing players are going to be our future I think is going to be valuable so I think it's actually perfect timing for Stephen coming in at the end of uh, next April when he comes into the senior international setup we've got to hope in the meantime next that June. Mick can get a tune yeah. Mick can get a tune out of the players in the meantime but I think there has been improvement I'm still very confident in terms of actually getting to the uh, the finals uh, next June and that performance is last night I think we could actually better I don't. I wouldn't actually talk it up as much as some other uh, people I think there's areas we certainly can improve and if we can tap into that improvement and we've all been talking about how we do that and everybody's got their own ideas yeah. uh, for me we can be very competitive even in the, in the finals next June Alright after this break to lighten things up a little here's Owen meeting some arrogant and some friendly Danes before last night's action. Post-match fan reactions coming later on in the show. We want to know what you think. Keep the comments rolling in. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Ah, Saturdays. A completely blank canvas for you to do with as you please. Can you collect my dress from dry cleaners? Sarah and Steve over tonight. Get wine. Also, downstairs bathroom needs attention. Hmm, they fill up fast Saturdays. But make sure you fill your boots with Paddy Power's Saturday Power Price, a super enhancement on a specific football treble every Saturday. Paddy Power sponsors the football show on Off the Ball. T's and C's apply. 18 plus on Louis.net. OTB AM.
All right, we are here in Temple Bar in the middle of Dublin City. Tonight, it is the Republic of Ireland against Denmark, and there are tons and tons of Danish fans. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Delaney said that it's saying Ireland is like opening a tin of beans with your bare hands. Would you agree with that as a supporter? Yes. Yeah. I agree. What do you think of Ireland as a footballing team? Uh, I, actually, we don't care. You don't care about Ireland? No. That, that hurts our feelings very much, though. Yes, yeah. I don't care. When you watch Ireland play, what do you feel? Do you, do, you, do you think that they're like poetry on the pitch, that they're the most beautiful football team you've ever seen? Uh, no. On paper, do you think that the Danish squad is miles ahead of the Irish squad? I mean, you're ranked 10th in the world. Yeah, on paper, the players maybe. Um, but the last few games, we've been pretty awful, to be honest. When you watch Ireland play football, how do you feel? Uh, definitely a team who plays with the heart. Oh, okay, right. That's for sure. You must, you must really love Christmas. I love Christmas. Yeah. 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 Christmas is the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We is. just put up our Christmas lights in Dublin the last day. But it's just happy, happy, happy. So you think you're going to be celebrating in Dublin tonight? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Third time in a row. Third day in a row. <laughs> and if Ireland's going to win, we're going to celebrate with them. Yeah. Well, thank you very yeah. much. You're more than welcome yeah. to join us. Yeah. But this day, here and now, is amazing. Never a true word spoken. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless. Good luck. Thanks, man. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. A bit Thanks. more respect, Don. A bit yeah. more respect for the clergy. And Patrick oh, from there, Croatia. Was, it, was he Danish? No, he's from Croatia. Oh, right. <laughs> is that their... Is that their... <laughs> Is that their away strip, Croatia, these days? Great, no, that's I don't, I don't, uh, don't venture to Temple Bar too often, so maybe he stands there all the time. Or that looked a bit just... awkward. I thought it was very good, like, although a few leading questions, but that last one looked a little bit awkward. Like, I wasn't sure of the chemistry between you and there. I was perfectly easy, Kenny. Man, seeing you there, you looked a little bit uncomfortable. Oh, that. I've actually might never be a few been more deeper It might be a few deeper with issues there, I don't know, but... Well, actually, literally the most uh, comfortable interview I've ever done. <laughs> You're getting something there, Kenny. You're chiseling yeah. away. Yeah, you're, you're getting there. The veneer, was there a little bite? Was there a little bit? Yeah. The veneer is cracking. A bite there. I don't know, I don't know. Tom Malone is here with us. Tom, what's going on? Yeah, uh, well, obviously, the Republic of Ireland, they'll have to get through a couple of playoff games to reach the Euro 2020 finals. Mick McCarthy's men failed to qualify automatically last night after a one-all draw with Denmark at the Aviva Stadium. Martin Braithwaite opened the scoring for the Danes on 73 minutes. And then defender Matt Doherty equalised with a header on 85 minutes. It was too late, though, as the boys in green finished third in the group behind the Danes and Switzerland. Mick McCarthy says the result was his only disappointment of the night. I thought we played well, I thought we competed well. And I said if before the game, and I always said the game, if they, if they leave everything on the pitch, they give everything for me, the lads, I'll take that. And I've got to take the results. So I'm disappointed with that. But that is the only thing I'm disappointed with the whole evening. Those playoffs will be held in March. If Wales beat Hungary tonight, then Ireland will be away to Slovakia in the semi-finals with Bosnia and Northern Ireland to contest the other semi-final. If Slovakia qualify at the expense of Wales, then Ireland will be away to Wales in the semi-finals. The draw for those playoffs will be made on Friday with home advantage to be determined for the finals there. Alan Brown says the players, though, while they may have a special night in March, wanted their special night to be last night. Everyone's got it. Um, you know, the gaffer's talking about... Uh, keeping our heads up you know we still have the playoffs which gives us another chance to qualify but I think um, everyone you know our, ourselves and the fans the staff everyone would have uh, wanted that special night tonight and uh, it just it just wasn't meant to be for us. Stephen Kenny's under-21 side will bid for their second group win over Sweden tonight in the Euro Championship qualifying. That encounter kicks off at 8 o'clock in Tala. Well, tonight Northern Ireland conclude their campaign away to Germany. Boss Michael O'Neill feels expectations need to be brought back to realistic levels after uh, there was disappointment among some fans in Belfast on Saturday night following a goalless draw with the Netherlands. O'Neill says they need to remember Northern Ireland are challenging with some of the giants of world football. Of course we were in a position to possibly take more points. People have to be realistic with the level of the opposition that we're playing against as well. And for us to get to the finals ahead of Germany and Holland, I'm not sure how many other teams in Europe would be capable of doing that. That's some pretty big news from the Premier League that's across most of the papers today. The future of Spurs manager Maurizio Pochettino may be in doubt. It's been revealed that the Argentine held crisis talks with club chairman Daniel Levy. Spurs currently 14th in the Premier League and have been out of sorts since reaching last season's Champions League final. Uh, While well in golf, Jonathan Caldwell, Niall Carney and Gavin Moynihan are still alive with two rounds of Q School to go in Spain. And is racing this afternoon from Ferry House. The first goes to post at 12.35. So. Pochettino, what do you think? Pochettino? 
in respect of... I, he's, he's had these crisis yeah. talks. Is that clear the air? Are they down? Do they get rid of him. Do Spurs just you pay them the money that he wants or something? There's no way. There's no way Daniel Levy just shows him the door. He's not it? even contemplating that. The only way reason that'll happen if Pochettino is actually looking, driving this and is looking for a way out and Daniel Levy gets a sense of his heart's not in it. He's not t- totally committed anymore. He wants to go. And if that's the case, that's the only part. But even then... He'll only go when Davi, uh, Daniel Levy decides it's the right time for Tottenham that he goes, and that would probably be the end of the season. I don't think that'll be mid-season, and I'll be very surprised if he's banging on the door, uh, Pochettino, um, being a kind of disruptive influence or going around with his chin on the floor like like most players would in that situation, making it perfectly obvious. Well, you don't want me around here. I'm not happy here. You better get rid of me. I'd like to think he's too good for that kind of too professional. You know, his ties to the club are too strong. I think there will be a part of the ways at some stage, but I'd like to think it'll be on good terms, and it certainly won't be in the next month or so. And Pochettino, I mean, obviously can go anywhere in the world he wants. There's no open job in English football at the moment, unless... If he, he won't go to another English cl- uh, club from... Uh, you don't think so? Be, even Manchester United would be very surprised. I can say, that. unless Man United decide, OK, thank you, Ole Gunnar, yeah. there's a director of football role, which we think you might be very suitable for. Oh, look, Richard Pochettino's <laughs> available. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think he's, he's in some respects, he's the perfect uh, fit uh, for Manchester United. I just think, I just think his connection with the club, Tottenham, what he's achieved there, what he's built there, it'd be very difficult for him to bounce from Tottenham into any other English club, uh, uh, even a club as great as Manchester United. I think he could manage in England again, but I think invariably he'll bounce abroad, whether it's that predominantly Spain, PSG, wherever it is, Italy, and find his way back to England uh, at some point. All right, okay. Um, some more post match fan reaction here. Uh, Owen on the beach getting post match reaction outside the Viva. Have a look. It's all over here in Dublin and it's finished. The Republic of Ireland won, Denmark won. Ireland now have to go through the back door to qualify for Euro 2020. Here, it's how the Ireland fans reacted to tonight's result. I thought Ireland were very unfortunate now not to get the. Uh, uh, the win uh, that they deserved, but listen. We'll uh, still get there. We'll still get there. Yeah, uh, hopefully we get there in the end through the playoffs. What do you think about Ireland's performance? Ireland's performance today was was good, better than Denmark. Of the flats. Yeah. What do you think, boys? I hope to win uh, the next game pretty much, and I thought they should Doesn't have got. Doesn't matter who we're gonna play. So who dominated the game? Ireland. Ireland. And who won the game? Nobody. Nobody, because it's <laughs> absolutely incredible. The best they played, I think, in the entire campaign. Um, deserved to go through, I thought, tonight. Unfortunate in the end, but um, it's, it, it's not over. It's, it's not over. It's far from over. No, it's not far We're going to the Euros. It's only fucking started. It's only fucking yeah, started. He, he used the F word. Who is this fella? We give everything. You know, we're, we're useless and we know that. But they give everything and that's what counts. I'd like to say hello to my mother. It's her <laughs> idiot birthday. Fantastic. I'm not, I'm not, like, I don't usually support Ireland, but like, tonight I did. A fantastic performance, but you know what? I'll be there in March. That'll be an unbelievable session. We'll be there! We'll be there! <laughs> we be there, fact. You from Cavan, eh? Monaghan, even better. Uh, devastated. Yeah? You know, um, at the beginning, we thought the dream was alive. We thought we'd be there. But I suppose we, we'll go to the playoffs and we'll see how we get on. But the dream is still there. It was a good performance. It's a pity that we didn't win, now. It was, it was a good game. I was, I was worried now because <laughs> they were running out of Guinness at one stage. Where? In the Aviva. Yeah. But I went up and I got another point. So it's all good now. Is that sort of, there, is, there was a winner tonight. There was a winner tonight. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. It could have been better. Um, I think we were the better team than I. Um, but again, like, you know, I was hoping for a bit of Irish magic. Uh, I was hoping for Ireland to, you know, come on, to come, come on, off there. <laughs> I wouldn't say, come on, Glenn Whelan. If it was on heart, 100% we would have won that game, would you? Why can't we play like that all the time? I don't know, maybe there's a lack of desire. I, 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 I honestly think it was a hey, mom, shot. Was TV. A... She doesn't like you anyway. I'd say everyone really put in a, put in the shift you could possibly expect from. Maybe James McLean at this stage while I love the bloke, does at this stage seem like he might be, the talent may be dwind, dwindling a bit. 
Uh, did one shot on target all game, they scored. Uh, we were a better team. Uh, we dominated possession as we all. Oh, I'm from Orkbor. Who's he? Like the fullbacks, Jesus Christ. They were brilliant. Like Doherty, fantastic, fantastic performance from Doherty, really. It took too long to make the right decisions. Shine of the guy, I should have been off at the start. See what he's done against New Zealand, like, great goal. But look, at the end of the day, we still have March, we still have the playoffs. Take it on there, take the positives. Like, oh, you know what I mean? Ireland played okay tonight, better than we have before, and we're optimistic for the playoffs. playoffs. Yes, yeah. Owen Sheehan's power rankings are terrible. They're terrible. <laughs> Galway ahead of Mayo all year. What the fuck? Very hopeful, very hopeful. Why not? Why not? Play very well tonight. They're a very good team. Eriksson, Premier League player, one of the best players in the world. Took him over the game. Very easy draw. Uh, for Denmark? Yeah. I, I think we controlled. No, Ireland were a better team tonight. Yeah. Who? Look, at the end of the day, look, chances were there, weren't taken. We take them on, take them out. See what happens. You, you know, we all know today Ireland played the best ever football. No, no, no. no. Yeah, they, 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 no. Just they the really, 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 no, really. They're the Today they try. Yeah, but they try to attack the game. We're, we're, Ireland is the greatest country I've ever been yeah, to. Too. This what? is the greatest country what? ever. Where is it? You are. Uh, you are I joke, I joke, I joke. the most friendly I people I have ever met. I love Can I swear? Of course you can. Referee was shit. He was shit. Should I have two penalties? But he, he was obviously a referee. He's chipping his shoulder against Ireland. Like. Yeah, why, do you, why do you think he developed that chip in his shoulder? Uh, that's just the British, you know what I mean? Like, we best luck to Denmark, and um, we we'll see you in uh, we we'll see you in the Euros. Best of luck. Just to, just to clarify, there, where's the referee actually from? No, it was Felix Brick from uh, Germany, wasn't it? <laughs> that's just the bricks you meant to say. <laughs> best fans in the world. I made a great decision there, handing over the mic at the start of that interview, and <laughs> letting them get on with it. Exactly, just let them. Uh, let took them a, took a step back. Like that's a great. Match. That's a that's a sign of a great broadcaster. Said the same about uh, Gay Bourne. God bless him. Just take a step back, let the conversation unfold before you. Done exactly <laughs> that. Oh, and you did exactly <laughs> that. You did exactly that. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> right, here's some Brian Kerr. Uh, Nathan bumped into the former Ireland boss Brian Kerr in the bowels of the arena last night. Uh, so of the Aviva, even here he is giving us his post-match thoughts. So, Brian, we're going to have to wait until March, it seems, to qualify for your 2020. What did you make of the performance? Well, uh, it was quite a good performance. I think individually and collectively the players played very well. Um, I'm sure, you know, Mick, when he analyses it, uh, he'd, be, he'd be majorly disappointed we didn't get the result we needed and probably deserved on the night. We were the better team. They only had one clear opportunity which they took other than that they had one shot in the first half Ericsson's hit Duffy on the head but other than that they didn't make a chance we had several chances um, Luca Huron was a clear cut one in the first half Brown had one as well I thought Conor Huron could have done a bit better with that shot and McGoldrick had an opportunity in the first half and we, he had won the second half in the first half then there was a, a short corner um, that we, we, we almost, mm. uh, sorry, yeah, in the second half, the short corner, route 10, and it couldn't go out, and it, it hit, the Schmeichel got a touch on it, it was a bit of a scramble. And there was a lot of moments of pressure early in the second half before they got the vital breakthrough. We were caught a bit, we, like we didn't recover quick enough from Stevens tried to cross the ball, it was blocked away, and then they went up the pitch, got a throw in, and we didn't get into position quick enough, and we're surprised by the cross. Maybe the goalkeeper could have done a bit better, Randolph. But I, I obviously felt the worst once they made the breakthrough because we just haven't been scoring goals, and I felt we badly needed to get the first goal in the game. But individually, as I said, I think a lot of players played better than we'd seen them before. Certainly, Alan Brown, Connor Hill, and Glenn. He's been around the block for years and years. But um, I thought Hendrick had a decent second half. Um, McGoldrick was better in the second half when he got a bit more ball. Uh, the full backs did well, and, 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 I, and I, I, I would be definite in saying I think Matt Doherty's performance tonight has put real pressure on, on Seamus Coleman, and, and is going to, you know, Mick is going to have to make that decision. But I, I think he did enough tonight to earn the place, uh, the starting place for the playoff. You don't think Mick looks at Doherty losing his man for the goal as maybe 
proof of why Coleman is in the team? Um, well, you, you, you know, you, you, you could say that. But you also look at is it is it. You know, with, with James and matched him just as well in the way in. Or he said, well, James got away a penalty in the last match by, by blocking the ball. I've been out of position a few times in the game earlier on when he started as a wing back. And, but I, I, I feel that Doherty did did really well in possession of the ball tonight. His passing was clever. He gets up and scores as a goal. I mean, once again, it's a defender scoring goals for us. So, but that, that's up to Mick to analyse. But I'm just saying, based on what we've seen, Doherty so far, where Mick was a, after the game in Gibraltar to start the group, it was easy for him to scout the idea of both of them playing together and maybe to scout Doherty playing on the left. Tonight, he, he, he's put it up to him a bit. So we have a long way to go now between here in March and we'll see whether it's Wales, Slovakia, maybe Bosnia are in the mix. Either way, it's going to be a difficult enough tie away from home. Do you think Mick goes with the same again, providing everybody's fit and ready, or were there enough there to suggest maybe there's other things you could do to get that type of performance and a bit more? Well, there'll be a lot of things could happen between now and March as regards players' fitness and injuries and whatever, and whether someone like James McCarthy or Harry Arter is playing a bit more regularly and come back into the pitch or as regards midfield players. Unfortunately, we don't seem to have much else for the attacking positions at the moment, unless the likes of Parrott, Shawnee McGuire starts scoring a flood of goals, which he hasn't been for Preston. Um, Collins, uh, you know, I wasn't surprised at how he played against with, um, against Denmark away. I didn't, I didn't think he had enough, and uh, Aaron Connolly will have more matches under his belt. So you know, there will be more information, and more more opportunities for Mick to view those players and make those decisions but I think the formation the way the team played tonight may lead to a situation where he's more confident about Alan Brown as a midfield player playing on the right side of the midfield Glenn once again put through a massive amount of effort and graft until he went off late in the game so I think I don't see him changing three of the back or anything like that Clark came in did quite well actually got a touch on the first four balls that come into the box at the Danish end mm. of the field wasn't far away from scoring so he did he did himself no harm either uh, Kieran Clark in terms of he's rescued his club career a little bit now tonight he's got on a massive match you don't get too many nights off on international weekend still you came in your night off you came to the match and you did enjoy a bit it for you. and did a bit you're not getting paid for this by the way I thoroughly enjoyed uh, being here tonight um, and being around before the match and sensing the atmosphere and feeling the hope from the public again and you know we, we now build up tonight giving out mm. about the FAI well, I was going to say do you feel a bit more comfortable coming back now that things have changed yeah certainly so and I felt a lot more welcome and comfortable and I didn't see anyone hiding behind walls when they saw me afraid to greet me in case they were talked about if they did um, and it was lovely to see so many of the staff that I worked with with, with the international team in the past out on the pitch earlier tonight and have a little chat and word with them and, and so on and, and and even some of the players and you know Robbie gave me a wave and, and so on so I, I was I was delighted to be here um, and I enjoyed the bit of, little bit of work for, for Virgin and, and you was talking off the ball tonight as well too but disappointed for everyone that we didn't get the result but look we live to fight another day the question I have is if we play away to Slovakia or someone else in the playoff, is it split gay? Did the FAI get half the money? <laughs> and, they'll not, and they'll have to pay the stewards. And I think it's a very relevant question in light of the circumstances the FAI are in at the moment. Well, I'll tell you what to do, Brian. You drop Noel Mooney an email and see what happens. <laughs> no, I think my, my days of emails with Noel may be past. Right. I think it's back to, back to my media watchdog role for the future. All right, well, you'll be in your media watchdog role back with a Sunday, Sheffield United, Manchester United. Live and off the ball. Great stuff, Brian. Yeah, look forward to that one, Ethan. Thank you. Always be closing, lads. Good stuff. Um, football and uh, uh, equivalent of Anne Robinson. Um, Brian Kerr by his own admission. <laughs> he was looking a million dollars last night. You couldn't see it there. He had these uh, brown leather slip-on shoes as nice. well. Oh, looked a million dollars. That didn't do him justice. Uh, yeah, it does, yeah. A little, uh, little cropped off uh, camera angle. <laughs> um, some interesting points in that that we should address. And then... Um, I just did. The shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more interesting than that. Go ahead. How do we how do we actually maintain what was that performance into the the next two? And and are there people whose roles in the team maybe will come under threat? Did James McLean play well enough? Did Jeff Hendrick play well enough last night? Yeah. 
So once we have a mention, which is very interesting, I give Mick credit for because some have been looking after the past couple of games. They're kind of three in midfield. Now, people look at last night and say, what changed? We played three in midfield. We didn't actually. We played with an orthodox midfield too. We played with Glenn Whelan and Conor Horahan alongside either, each other, 10, 15 yards apart. And Jeff played in advance of that. Jeff really played as a second striker uh, higher up the pitch. Now, that's something which kind of I've been looking for the last couple of games. I've been at, thinking, I did, I'd like to see. Cause for me, it makes us more defensively secure getting somebody alongside uh, Glenn in that central midfield area, staying behind, behind the ball. That makes us more defensively secure. Now you've got to ask the question, Jeff Hendrick, I'm a big fan of, is that his best position playing just off the strike as a number 10? I actually don't think it is. So that opens up the possibility going forward, if Mick's going to stick with this kind of two banks of four, predominantly Alan Blow played on the right-hand side last night, but who's our best combination in the central area high up the pitch? And I think this is where it gets actually quite exciting. You throw Aaron Connolly uh, into the equation, you start talking about potentially Jack, uh, Jack Bourne, uh, Callum Robinson can play there, Troy Parra, etc., etc. Then I actually start getting a little bit more excited. You start talking about, we're talking about creativity in the team. Well, then I'm look, t- looking at combinations potentially going forward, thinking actually getting quite excited. Troy Parra, a another uh, uh, Jack Bourne, just even having a natural f- pairing up there. Now, I know um, Jeff played there, he was in contact with Dave McGoldick last night, but he's predominantly a central midfield player. And there is a difference between playing somebody who's a, traditionally, albeit an attack minded central midfield player, and someone who's actually natural more of a center forward in that position just off the front i think there is a difference in terms of output in terms of what you get so that so that's i i actually enjoyed i thought it was the right decision for mick to go to that system last night basically with four four two we're you know we're splitting hairs we played two banks of four alan brown on the right and and jeff just off yeah Dave four, four, one. Yeah, yeah and this you know we haven't got robbie you know we haven't got robbie king let's forget that argument for me now we got some really good potential options in that central area of the pitch going forward and players who can naturally complement each other. And you're right, the discussion of those wide areas now is even heightened even more so in terms of James. James has been a brilliant service for, uh, for us, but again, nobody guarantees a start in Northern Jersey. The same discussion is going to be had about Seamus in that right-back position. I think we've got some really options, uh, great options in that those wide areas. I think there's an argument for, rather than playing that traditional wide midfield player, say James, naturally left foot, hugs the touchline, beats his man on the outside, maybe playing somebody who naturally gravitates towards the inside, say Callum Robinson, uh, kind of Ronan Coors, even an Aaron Connolly down that side of the pitch, maybe that type of player is prepared to come inside and comfortable playing on the inside right. and naturally open up those those lanes on the outside for your end of Stevens, for your Matt Dock. There's an yeah. argument, you're talking yeah. about even where do we get our creativity, where is that going to come from, those little patterns, maybe that's something which potentially make a look, look towards come next March. But I think we have got real options. I don't want to finish the, like this morning coming in here. I know we've been shouting and screaming a little bit, but I don't want to give the impression that any kind of negativity or a bit, a bit of gloom or a dark clouds descend, particularly not in my attitude. I like what I'm saying, actually. And the frustration for me when I look at that Ireland team still, not kind of frustration, but kind of frustration mixed with excitement, actually, is that there's more to come. There's actually more in us. You know what I mean? There really is. And we can tap. That's an easy thing for me to say. No, I, I if we agree. can tap into I absolutely it. Agree, but we're talking yeah. about to say, how do we tap into that? What do we put in those patterns of play? How do we do that with the players that we have available to us? What template do we put down? All of those things. That's coaching and management. That's the hard bit. Mick and his coaching staff have got to do it. Easy for me to talk from the outside looking in. But I think we can. If we, if we can find a little bit extra. And I think there's more there. Then for me, we, we, we can really are offer, offering a threat. And for me, I really fancy our chance of getting through to the finals. Okay, I'm going to read out some of the uh, comments that we've had coming across. Uh, Siobhan Odour says I understand McLean works like a dog off the ball but when goals are needed as a winger with Duffy in the box he can't deliver and don't get me started on Hendrick Connor says the game was crying out for Jack Byrne last night good in possession has a goal from outside the box in him I'm capable of unlocking that defence last night without using too many crosses McLean Hendrick Horahan Brown great heart but not as technical as the younger lads coming through Hendrick has a 10 he hadn't a clue what he was doing that's mixed fault I thought Conor Heron played well I thought that like having his range of passing yeah, at the base of midfield was really useful to be able to... Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's one of the advantages of playing Connor in terms of his pass and range. And I think his strengths are in that area of the pitch as a two, when we have possession of the ball, then you can just strong argue for, yeah, this is why he's in the team. Get him on the ball. Keep it simple. Be a big switch of play. Even maybe Lincoln uh, with the forward players, he's got a hammer of a shot. I think which isn't the strongest part of his game, which is probably the same argument you can make against Jeff, who's only haven't got the ball. Trusting him, yeah, trusting him to sit in there, see danger, make tackles, track runners, cut those passing channels, all those things, those questions which are asked time and time again during the course of 90 minutes. So that's the kind of the interesting conversation about Conor Hurahan and that kind of central midfield there. That's why the likes of Jack Cullen, the, not the clamour, 
but the, the noise around Jack Cullen may be coming into that central midfield position. Probably very similar to Glenn in terms of having a good all-rounded game. Very comfortable sitting in there behind the ball, seeing danger, just moving the ball efficiently around the pitch. That more of an all-rounded central midfield player, and potentially he might get his opportunity between now and the summer. And did Josh Cole play well enough in the first game against New Zealand to? Yeah, I've seen enough actually. I've seen enough, yeah. and I understand timings, everything. Massive game coming up, huge pressure, calculated risk thrown him. I understand all that, but I like what I've seen from that young play. He uses the ball very well. Maybe hasn't got. Uh, Connor's passing range as such but uses the ball very efficiently he actually can get ahead of the ball when he wants to and when he sits in that central midfield area I think you can trust him in terms of seeing danger sliding across engaging people doesn't ground, go to ground too often never, never, didn't see him jumping into too many tackles kind of off his feet pretty much desperate stuff that's what happens when you don't see danger too quickly enough you don't track runners invariably you're trying to bail yourself out throwing yourself into tackles those central midfielders who read the game well have that kind of defensive mentality don't have to do so because invariably they're in the right uh, uh, position uh, early just have to shift five ten yards constantly and they can do the job in there so I'm actually quite encouraged what I'm seeing from uh, uh, Josh Cullen Jason Malumby's another player for me the 21s he's playing at Millwall at the moment potentially he might be a little bit further down the road but he's that he has that kind of uh, energy, kind of real physicality, kind of aggression to his play, which we haven't gotten too many of our other central midfield players. Maybe that's a little bit further down the line, but they're the kind of options that, that Mick will be looking at. Wales stuck Ampadu straight in the team, even though he wasn't uh, yeah. first team regular at that stage, because they liked what they saw of him. Yeah. Do we, do we need to start? I, look, I've no problem with that. I have absolutely no. I trust Mick. I trust, he, again, easy for me to say, yeah, play Josh Cullen, I've seen enough, blah, blah, blah. But Mick's got to make that decision. He knows the player better for me, he knows the personality. Uh, he sees him around the training pitch. Can he cope with the demands on him in a high pressurised environment, potentially buzzing away in the semi final? Uh, Mick's and his coach have his best place to make that decision. But in terms of, kind of his technical ability, in terms of analysis of his game, for what I was saying, I think he's a player who's going to get an opportunity sooner rather than later but in that central midfield area. We're about to hear from Alan Brown here. Is he yeah. also at the base now because he's had that experience tonight? And yeah, I think I think he's, a, he's another one for an argument. If you're going to go to even a midfield too, I think there's an argument for Allen there just because of that, the leg power which he has, the athleticism, the ability to go uh, uh, box to box. He's got a goal in him. Well, he's more your traditional type of midfielder when people hire back to, well, centre midfielders used to do everything. Go back, defend, head it, tackle, get it on the ball, keep it safe and arrive in the box. Get into the box as well. Dovetail. Those two centre midfielders dovetail. And Alan Brown can do that. He's got the legs to get into the box and got a great goal scoring record at Preston as well. So although I'm talking about potentially Josh Cullen going forward is an option there. Yeah, I think there's an argument for throwing Alan Brown in there as well. All right, let's bring you some Alan Brown because here he is talking in the aftermath of the match. Quite disappointed after the one-all draw last night. Have a look. Uh, I think it's overall feeling a disappointment. Um, you know, the boys left everything out there. We tried to give the fans something to cheer about and uh, the goal probably pegged us back. But, you know, we left everything out there and it just wasn't to be. What was the atmosphere like in the dressing room there before you left? Everyone's got it. Um, you know, the gaffer's talking about uh, keeping our heads up. You know, we still have the playoffs, which gives us another chance to qualify. But I think um, everyone, you know, ourselves and the fans, the staff, everyone would have uh, wanted that special night tonight. And uh, it, just, it just wasn't meant to be for us. Is it one of those nights where you come off the pitch thinking, we left absolutely everything out there? Yeah, it is. Um, and I think they were there for the taking. I think everyone felt that. Uh, you know, they, I don't know if they didn't play up to their standards or we exceeded ours, but they were certainly there for the taking. And uh, it was just disappointing uh, to concede when we did because I think we were on top of that stage of the game and it kind of came against the run of play. Yeah, so there's room for him in the team, there's room for Josh Cullen in the team. Is there room for, he's made the team now, so sometimes it's harder to get out of it than get in it. Is he going to be a starter, do you think, for the playoffs? Well, Oh, no, I don't think it's a, a guarantee. I think some difficult decision uh, calls Mick's got to make. First, in terms of the team shape, I think he'll stick now. When you spoke about it, he's kind of experimented with the back three. He'll probably go back to the uh, the back four. But for me, it's only people might think it's a small adjustment. But the adjustment of going from one holding midfielder, number six, and two advanced midfielders, and number eight, and a lone striker, to uh, a partnership at the base and a number 10 playing behind the central striker, for me, that's really significant. That's the biggest decision that Mick has to make. And once he's made that decision, well, I'm going to stick with a midfield too. For me, then that opens up a whole po a list of possibilities. Where, who's that uh, central uh, striking pairing uh, going to be? Then the conversation will turn to 
uh, Jack Bourne potential combination who complements each other Troy Parrott potentially McGoldrick uh, Callum Robinson will come to that corner they'll all come into the equation and then you're talking about well who do you want the wide areas to best supplement complement the players you have in there are, they, are we playing with centre forwards or very good, good headers of the ball good attacking crosses into the box well that might have a knock on effect in terms of who potentially you're yeah. looking to play in war days all. So that they are the things that Mick has to knit together. But my point is, we've actually got up. It's not as if we're scratching our head. I'm looking at the squad thinking, what do these players offer? Every one of those players, I'm looking at their individual qualities and think, yeah, I like him. I like the qualities. I understand the qualities he has. Maybe not so strong in this area, but but it really impresses me in this area of the pitch. On the ball, runs, uh, toward man runs off the ball, crosses into the box, attacking headers, ag- aggressive when we haven't got the ball. So we've got all of that. It's all kind of there for me. So that's what kind of I'm still very excited going forward. Does Robbie Brady have a future in this team at all? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I think there was even an argument for playing Robbie in that uh, wide right midfield position last night. Even an orthodox, we should get too carried away with right foot players playing the left. Even as a, you're talking about, we're talking about left wing potentially yeah. up for grabs. When you were talking about it, somebody who comes in naturally. That, I mean, that that's actually where he played his best football for Ireland was kind of in that central area. Yeah, exactly. He played that three. He played that three alongside uh, Jeff and, and Glenn in behind. But if we're saying we're going to uh, deviate away from that a little bit, there's still an argument for Robbie over both uh, sides of the pitch. I'm talking about Matt Doherty or Seamus Coleman getting on those overlapping runs, like wingers being prepared to come on the inside and open that space up. Yeah. Where wingers coming in onto their strong foot and delivering with their left foot, like Robbie, as Robbie Brady does very effectively. Again, you could see a natural combination there, potentially. We have a rule which we didn't tell you about. His name is Matt Doherty in this studio, Kenny. Matt Doherty, all day long and twice on Sundays. What did I call him? You've been living too long in England. Matt, Matt. <laughs> What's his name? Matthew, what did I call him? Matthew. <laughs> Doherty. Yeah, right. that's it, that's it. Well done. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Kenny. Yeah, yeah, went quick, that. It is. Is that good or bad? Is that good or bad? That's a bit shouting. A bit too much shouting going on, I thought. Ideally. All, all light and how, how no heat. How does that heat. come across? How does that? Yeah, good. We've got a nap in, in our ear from the box. So that's, uh, that's two thumbs up. <laughs> Right, uh, we're going back to Mayo Leaks. Mayo County Board has informed the Mayo sports journalist Michael Gallagher that his nomination for the role as public relations officer, the PRO, has not been accepted because of a technicality. Earlier this morning, Michael uh, took a call from us to talk to Owen to tell us why he now plans to legally challenge that decision. Okay, so when I was in Castle Bar the week before last, I spoke to a few people around the town about the current situation with the Mayo GEA County Board. One of those people was Michael Gallagher, who had announced that he was going to run for the position of PRO. Now, that position would have been decided at next month's county convention. Things have changed, it seems, in that race, and Michael Gallagher joins us in the line. Good morning to you, Michael. Uh, Good morning, Owen. So, as I mentioned there, you were, I think it's fair to say, uh, running for the position of Mayo GEA PRO. What's happened since? Um, Everything was going fantastically. And uh, on Sunday night, after the nominations closed, I got a phone call from... At the Mayo County Board, uh, they believed that they were ruling me out of the race, uh, saying that uh, my nomination was ineligible um, and quoting uh, quoting a rule. And uh, that, that, that was devastating initially. But What, what was the rule? Um, uh, we'd rather stay, keep that to ourselves because it, it was the absolutely incorrect rule. Um, it was, uh, to be honest, I I I, I can look. Uh, and it it was, they got the they got the numbering wrong of the rule. Put it like that. So, you know, th- that's ineptitude, ineptitude. It, it seems, uh, Michael, from what we've seen from uh, communication within the Mayo County Board, it seems that they're throwing you out for not being registered with your club uh, before um, March thirty first this year, and therefore not in time to be somebody who runs for the county board. Uh, this year, before uh, the close of the year, is that correct? That's what they're saying. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and uh, w- w- were you registered with your club? Um, have been, uh, but but as as you can imagine, uh, there isn't much sense in the in Mayo County Board. So uh, we've uh, for the past, I've had three three hours sleep in the last two nights because I've been working on this. Um, so. Uh, no disrespect to yourself, uh, but uh, as Mayo County Board are known to say, this is sub say, we have, myself and my wife and my two daughters, we've had to take the decision that we're going to go legal on this. Uh, we're going to take on Mayo County Board and uh, go as far as we have to because uh, this is absolutely incorrect what they've done, uh, incorrect morally and legally and uh, 
supportingly and it means so much to us. Um, I, I think Mayo County Board thought we'd go away and fade away and wait till next year to run again. Um, and, and, and initially that were, that were the thoughts, those were the thoughts we had um, because nobody likes conflict and nobody, particularly my family, do not like uh, any conflict with Mayo GEA because it is part of our lives um, for, for generations. And the last thing we want to do is to be in conflict with uh, Mayo GEA, but, and, and we're not, we're not in conflict with the, the body of Mayo GEA. We're only in conflict with uh, the decision that was made on Sunday night. So, so, so just, just to, be, to be clear, Michael, is your dispute with the actual information that they have? Are you saying that, no, that's wrong, I was a paid-up member of my club? Or are you saying, uh, no, that's correct, I, I wasn't a paid-up member of my club, but it's wrong to disqualify me on such grounds? Um, <laughs> you're too good with the questions. Um, our, our thoughts, uh, and look, at the, the, there's much more to this. The uh, We are asking that Mayo County Board uh, use the rule the way they have used it for the past decade. Um, uh, we, we have, we have uh, concrete information in our hands that this was not the way that the rule was enforced for the past decade. Um, I, I'm, one can read through that. It doesn't take a genius to read what I'm saying there. Um, Michael Geller has been singled out for different treatment than many other uh, officers and uh, members of the executive over the past decade. So it is it is absolutely uh, obvious that um, Mayo County Board don't have a, a, legal, a legal leg to stand on. Um, I, I, I have hard copy, we have hard copy, myself and my legal team, we've hard copy over the last uh, 24 hours of our case being proven. Uh, we will be taking this as far as we have to go, and I mean as far as we have to go. But um, right now, and, and through your good self, I haven't spoken to anyone else. Um, I am asking for the Mayo County Board to stand back from their decision on Sunday night, which is legally incorrect, and uh, to uh, reinstate me in the race, as, as, uh, and to th that's all I'm looking for because this is going to cost a huge amount of money to Martina and I, but also we're very confident we're going to win, so it will cost a lot of money to Mayo County Board, and that's the last thing they want to be doing at this stage, especially when they're meeting with Krug Park today, this afternoon, to discuss the debacle of the past few months. Yeah, and because of that meeting today and because of what we've seen from Mayo County Board over the last couple of weeks, I would say that we're not going to hear an explanation from Mayo GEA on why they've, why they've arrived to this decision like yeah. so I, I really just do need to, to clarify here, were you a paid up member of your club at this time, uh, but by March 31st this year? Uh, I certainly and my legal team believe we are, but that is, uh, that is uh, not in any way the basis of our legal argument. What, what is the basis of your legal argument? That the the rule, uh, first of all, the rule that I was thrown out on is, is absolutely incorrect. And then Mayo County Board came back last night and sent out a, di a different rule. Uh, what, the what, was the, what was the other rule, Michael? We've only got the, the one kind of correspondence here, which was the initial one saying that you hadn't been registered with your club. Uh, no. If you look at the rule, the rule they sent you. Yeah. So the, the rule, the, only a full member uh, who is paid read the, is... Read the, the number of that rule. Uh, 2.1. Uh, only a full right. member who has paid his annual club subscription by okay. the due date uh, shall be eligible to vote at, nominate for, or seek election to the executive committee. That, like, you know, what, what's the what's the incorrect nature of that? Where did you get that? Uh, the, that was that's from correspondence from within the Mayo County Board. Uh, yeah, but was it some, was it from the Sunday night? They, they sent. I ju I just happened mine in front of me. Yes, they have Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's the incorrect rule. And they they try to they try to uh, uh, recover that by sending out another rule last night to my club, saying, "Oh, sorry, this is we sent the wrong rule. Uh, this is the real rule, and uh, we trust that you'll you'll accept this 
uh, this is the proper rule. And, and it's, sorry, just for full clarity here, the rule is just under a different number or is the rule entirely different in terms of what it actually says? Entirely different in wording. Right, okay, so you're, you're not being drawn after it. So, so what, what, is, what is the correct wording then? Uh, to be honest, I, 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 I don't have the correct wording in front of me, you know, but it's a totally different rule and, and they, the county board secretary contacted my club last night saying, uh, sorry lads, we sent the wrong rule on Sunday night. Uh, this is the correct rule and it's a different number and different wording and this is this is the rule we're throwing them out under. But, but it, it is kind of the general gist, Michael. That's just what I want to get to the point here. There, there isn't some other thing that they've thrown at you. It is... Oh, no, 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 no. They would have to could, but they can't. Yeah. But, it's, but it's generally to do with the fact that, you ha that they believe you haven't been registered with a club and you believe that you have been registered with a club at that point. Like, like, do you remember signing up with your club at the start of the last season or, or, or before the, the 31st of March deadline? Oh, and I'm just telling you now straight. Our legal argument, and there are many, are that Michael Gallagher is being treated completely different than other members who are currently sitting on Mayo County Board and the way that they were elected. Michael Gallagher's, there's a rule for Michael Gallagher there's not a rule for everyone else. What's what's your suspicion of how uh, Mayo, GA, the, the county board are going to go about these next few weeks? Uh, do you think that there is going to be a situation where there might be a reshuffle, for lack of a better phrase, where people might seek election in different roles and eventually after convention, Mayo, GA is hoping to end up with a very similar county board executive? There's change already. Uh, there's a, the, a new treasurer from Charlestown, outstanding woman, uh, she isn't being uh, opposed, so she's in as treasurer. There's a, a new race for the chairmanship. Um, there will be a new race for the PRO, and there's a new race for vice chairman. Mm. So there's going to be change right through in every aspect of Mayo GA. And uh, as you can imagine, Sunday night I was I was uh, in bad form, uh, but in the following hours, even through the night, the 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 uh, the messages that I was getting from clubs across Mayo, from ordinary people across Mayo, but particularly from clubs, that is hurting. It is driving us on, and there is huge sense of need for change. There's a huge thirst for change, and 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 I firm, I'm going to stick into this as long as as long as humanly possible to try and and and, and get back in the race. What why do you think they're targeting you? That's a, a final point, Michael. Before we wrap things up. Uh, I'm a professional, as you know yourself. I'm a journalist for the past 20 years. Um, I would be very straight, very honest. So I would have always said what I thought of uh, the shenanigans that go on in Mayo GA. So um, it was obvious I was going to be targeted from way out. And, and I have been. And this was the final bit of the targeting. Mm. And I presume what happens next now is that you're just waiting to hear back from Mayo GA if they're also willing to go the distance on this legally. Oh, yeah, fair play to them. I, I, I wouldn't expect anything else. That, that's the way they operate. So it, it will be an interesting few weeks. And if we have to take out an injunction to stop the AGM, we'll do that as well. Right, OK. Well, uh, Michael Gallagher, uh, looking to get into the running for um, AOG County Board, PRO. Thanks many for taking the call this morning. Really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks, so. Wow. Um, I, the possibility of an injunction being taken out over county board elections. Things have got very, very nasty in Mayo very quickly, haven't they? Mm. Yeah, they, they certainly have. There's, there's so much to it. I completely even forgot that Croke Park have stepped in and that meeting is happening this morning and they still have this on the side trying to push a candidate out of, of a race for PRO. There were some question marks about whether the current PRO will be going for that role or whether he'll be going for a bigger job. Will he now go back to stay for PRO because this guy now isn't coming in or perhaps his uh, running is under threat? There's a fascinating political spider web here in Mayo GA County Board, and that's not even getting into the financial thing. We're obviously asking the Mayo County Board for a response to that. We will be um, reaching out to them this morning. I think we already have indeed, and uh, we'll bring you that response on offtheball.com as we, <laughs> as we get it. Um, I'm just going to read one of uh, the... Uh, tweets that came up. Gilroy, you're clueless. Ireland were excellent last night. You want a manager who talks shit about philosophy and ambition. Fuck up, you boring. Breen <laughs> tore you a new one there. It's Gary Breen on Twitter. There you go. Ask John, 22, 18, 40, 79. Come on, John. Thanks for uh, getting involved in the debate this morning and elucidating your, your views in our general direction. 
it's a uh, like no matter what happened, it's just one of these uh, brilliant things that that happened last night. No matter what your view on Mick McCarthy or Irish football, it would have hardened it. No matter if you're a pro Mick no. or anti Mick, it would it, it, it would have hardened it. It no. would have been like they're brilliant. Look what Mick can do. I thought they're we played, brilliant. Look I what thought, Mick failed to do. I thought we played well. I thought we played well in parts, but like. There's still these weird blind spots, and then afterwards, there's the no, I didn't make any mistakes ever. It's like, yeah, I made a few mistakes along the way. Actually, you know, if we'd played like that the whole time, perhaps if we'd played like it was a quarter to midnight on Doomsday, which is what we played a little bit like last night, with that sense of oh, this is really urgent. We need to do stuff here. But I keep going back to the first game in Gibraltar, and the signs are there from that point all the way through that they don't look like they're working on everything all the time. And uh, maybe Gary Brink can see stuff in last night's performance that suggests that the work on the training ground is finally beginning to pay off. But going three at the back, picking the wrong players and not working on it, that's not a well-managed, well-coached team. No. Uh, I, I will say, however, that uh, Kenny, listening through all the possibilities of our next wizard, number 10, makes me very excited. Yeah, uh, look, I think there's a good the, team the prospects there. prospects are, are, are great. The, it, it is just about what happens in March and I think... The other 21s as well. Games on, yeah, well, obviously, but the, like two games on the road. and I don't know, I, th I, I think that um, it's just a double hurdle for Mick McCarthy to cross and it could be a double hurdle tactically as well in terms of what they're going to, to come up against. All right, that's your lot today. We're back at 7.30 tomorrow morning. You can podcast this show. It's fully timestamped, so it's easy to find what you want. We're obviously on Spotify or the uh, podcast app. The best place to get us now is the Go Loud app, which you can download wherever you get your apps. And also, of course, offthewall.com forward slash podcasts. On YouTube, you can subscribe while you're there. And you can Chromecast that. You can get it uh, on your smart TV or your Apple TV. OTB Sports Radio is live all day, every day, via the Go Loud app. And uh, Off The Ball is live on air and online from 7 o'clock tonight. We'll see you tomorrow. Good luck. OTB AM. This.